welcome to KTG lecture. Um, today, we have we are delighted to have uh, Professor Fyodor Kuznetsov <coughs> from um, uh, Telecom Paris Tech. <coughs> uh, he will today he will talk about uh, combinatorial structure for computing. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for uh, for having me over. And um, so the uh, I cooked up a little web page with uh, where I put the slides and the uh, links to the references. Like, uh, and basically, there are a couple of major references for this type of uh, uh, work. Um, and uh, well, I, I, I know that it's um, it's not in the Japanese tradition to interrupt and ask questions, but I would still encourage you to stop me whenever something gets unclear. And uh, it's a bit tricky for me because this uh, I, I I never presented this stuff for this type of audience. So usually, what uh, what when when I well, I have this class and teach I teach the uh, combinatorial topology for distributed computing, but it's 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 intended for for computer science students. And uh, I have a lot of background in mathematics, so I, I, here I guess I can skip all this. Instead, what I will try to do is to give you some flavor of what this field of distributed computing is about, and then why combinatorics is a good tool to analyze distributed algorithms. Okay. So I have slides, but I will try to also switch between slides and uh, Blackboard. So, um, well, I say computing. Uh, so what is computing? So what, what, do we, what, do we, what do we understand as, as computing? So what is the classical definition of? Well, I guess one of the popular definitions is processing information. But what, what does it mean to process information? I need this answer because I, I need to go to the uh, what to distribute the computing. Well, there is a, there is a common model which basically everybody accepts, which is the model of a Turing machine, which is uh, an automaton with uh, some states, with some state transitions, and some inputs and outputs. So it has a uh, has a, a tape of, uh, of of an input program. Yeah. So we have. I don't know, the, the automaton, it accepts a program and produces outputs. Okay? There, is, there might be some non-determinism within the automaton, but it's, it's basically related to randomization in the algorithm. It's not, it's not some external non-determinism. Okay? So now when we come to distributed algorithms, we talk about a collection of Turing automata. Yeah? So now we have possibly many of them. Okay. Each having a separate program. Uh, well, to make things non-trivial, <laughs> of course, we need to assume that these guys uh, communicate. Because if they don't communicate and they operate on separate data, it's like uh, the same theory, a classical theory of sequential computing, but uh, uh, multiplied. Okay. So uh, distributed algorithms are about communicating processes. And uh, they don't only communicate, they may share data, but they also share data in a non-trivial way. Yeah? So we assume that they may have conflicts over data. Yeah? So they assume that we have potentially some data races, or race conditions. And to give you an example, I just, uh, maybe it's a good example because it will give us a link to our, what we understand by modeling distributed systems in a combinatorial way. Um, let's imagine like this, probably the simplest program ever in a distributed context. And uh, let's imagine that we have two processes. And usually we denote these processes by P0 and P1. Uh, there is a reason to do it this way. It's like we have process zero, process one. Yes, yeah? so we have two programs. Process zero, process one. And each program is sequential. And the difficulty comes from the fact that the programs actually operate on, on shared data. Okay. Well, let's assume that the, uh, the program is symmetric. So each process does the following. So we have uh, P0, which uh, uh, takes uh, some uh, 
register writes zero to it, and then uh, read register r1. Yeah, we assume that each of the processes is associated with a single register to write. And it can read the register of the other. So the shared memory for us is, is just an array of two registers, R0 and R1. Okay? Symmetrically, P1 writes 1 to R1. Yeah, it's its own identifier. And then read R0. Okay? So these are two uh, sequential programs, okay? Which operate on the same data. Yeah, on the same shared array. An interesting question is what kind of states are reachable by, the, by this distributed program in all possible execution scenarios? And you see, the, the tricky thing here is that since I didn't say anything about time, I didn't say that the processes are supposed to take these steps synchronously. Yeah? It doesn't mean that these guys simultaneously read and then simultane simultaneously write and simultaneously read. No. They may take these steps in an arbitrary order, each following its own sequential spec, but the, uh, the, uh, the steps can interleave, arbit interleave arbitrarily. Okay, what does it mean? It means that I can, well, usually what we, we try to visualize it using uh, this, this time flow chart. So we, this is the time as it flows at, at process P0. This is time as it flows at process P1. Yeah. What can happen? For example, one possible execution scenario is they both write sort of at the same time, yeah? And then they both read at the same time. Yeah, I should probably say that the, for simplicity, we, let's assume that all these operations are atomic. Yeah, the, every access to the shared memory takes place instantaneously, like in one indivisible moment of time. Yeah, which means that all events of this kind, like executing one line of this kind, can be visualized as one point in, in, in time, and all these events are totally ordered. But the difficulty is that they can interleave. So here we have the first write, and then read. Yeah, so here P0 writes to R0, then it reads R1. Here P1 writes to R1 and reads R0. Okay, so this is, this is one possible run. Yeah, so it's, uh, they do, do it this way. I don't really care how exactly they they, 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 they interleave here, but what's important is that both of them see the values written by the other process. Like each of them would see the value written by the other. This is one possible execution. Another execution could be this kind. And this is scenario one, scenario two, again, P0, P1. But now, this time, imagine that uh, P0 is much faster. So it, uh, it happened to execute its program before P1 even started. Okay, so you have uh, this kind of execution. And, and is it okay with this uh, formalism? Like I just uh, the point here, it means the step, the first step of the of, of of this process. This is the second step of the execution of this process. Okay. Yeah. So this is one possible execution. Yeah. P0 finished its program before P1 started. And then finally, symmetrically, we have uh, yeah. Uh, this scenario, yeah. Okay? Here, P1 was faster than P0. Yeah? So now, let's try to use, like, I claim that this, uh, this, uh, this is the, the exhaustive set of uh, executions which describes all possible reachable states. Yeah? So let's uh, try to visualize it uh, in some way. Uh, so that's, that's where combinatorics comes because you have uh, now you have a source of non-determinism which relates to the uh, scheduling, how exactly the steps of different processes interleave, and that gives you a scope of possible executions, possible reachable states. And now we can play. Yeah, we have we can actually model it in some way and uh, look what kind of uh, structure we obtain and uh, reason about the properties of this structure and deduce something about the. Uh, the uh, the physics of computation, right? Is it real? What what's what's happening? What can be computed? What not? Okay. So let's uh, let's see. Uh, let me see. I guess I can take this blue and, and white. Uh, right. So uh, let's uh, say that 
each of these two processes can get one of two states at the end of the program. Yeah? What are these states? One state is where it sees the input of the other process, and the other state is which it does not. Okay? So for example, if I here, both processes are in the state where they both see each other. Here, only one process sees each other, uh, sees the other, which is uh, P1. Yeah? P0 doesn't see the, sta the, the state of P1 because P0 completed the program before P1 wrote to the memory. Okay? Symmetrically here, it's only P P0 who, who sees P1, but not the vice versa. So we have two, two states per process, possible reachable states. Yeah? So this, let's, let's try to visualize this. We have, uh, I, I use white color for P0 and blue color for P1. Yeah? So that's, uh, uh, we will eventually we'll come to the notion of chromatic simplicial complexes. That's exactly where colors come from. Okay, so I have uh, one state for uh, P0. Well, actually I have two states for P0, which is uh, one state is, is I, I would denote with bottom, I would say that bottom it sees nothing. And here it sees one. Yeah, so it's, it's, this is what, what it wrote, what, what, it, what it read in, uh, in uh, register R1. Yeah, it either can read bottom, which means nothing, no value, it's initial value, or it can read one. Uh, I'm not sure I, I choose the right spot for, for doing this. Let me do it here. Yeah, like, like this. So I have, okay, so it's bottom or one. Now, I have two states for P, P1, okay? So I have, again, I have bottom, and I have one. So these are all possible states which process can reach after they finish this program, okay? Now the question is which of these states are compatible, which can, which can be observed in the same execution? Yeah, we, we already, convinced ourselves that there are only three possible executions. Yeah? So let's try to see these possible executions in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, on, the, on this image. Well, what can happen? So the first one, both of them see each other, which is this one. And I connect the two states with an edge by showing that these two states are compatible. They can be observed in the same execution. Yes. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. So this here it's is zero. Yeah. Right? So this is this is one execution. Then I have an execution in which one is faster, the other one is slow. Yeah, for example, process P0 is fast, it sees uh, process P0 is fast, it sees only itself. P1 sees P0. Yeah, so this is Execution scenario uh, two. And then finally we have symmetrically this one. Yeah. So we have four states, yeah? two states per process, three executions. What about this one? Can we connect these two H points here? Can we imagine an execution in which the two processes uh, end up in these two states. Well, I claim we cannot because it means that both of them miss the input values of each other. And which means that uh, somehow in, in the shared memory context in our model, this cannot happen because you're, you always have this indivisible event where you write. When you complete your write, the write is done, the, the value is in the memory. Yeah. In other models, which are not using, for example, shared memory, or use weak forms of shared memory with some local caches which are not necessarily propagated to the uh, caches of other processes, this behavior could, be, have, could have been observed. Yeah. And for example, you're, you're, you use message passing, and you see they send messages to each other, and then they complete the protocol before any of these messages arrive. In this, in this case, I, I can actually find a link like this, but not, not in the model we consider, okay? So we don't have it. 
Right. So then, uh, let's uh, let's move on. Maybe we can have uh, uh, other programs. Yeah, we can also have the, the one popular construction is implement to implement a shared counter. Yeah, something like a, uh, a, a shared memory location, which increments the number of operations executed by different processes. Yeah, so again, we have uh, P0, we have P1, and uh, well, the program is very simple. You just uh, have a shared, mo shared memory location counter, and both of them execute an increment operation. Yeah, so here, this we usually denote uh, increment. Yeah. Well, I should say that in uh, again in the model we consider there are no counters implemented in the hardware. What we do have we have reading and writing. Uh, and the trick here is that if you look at this, you, you may imagine that okay, uh, this is like an atomic operation. You are you increment it. And as a result, if, you're, if, the, if the initial value of the counter is zero, yeah, one process executes that increment, it becomes one, the other increments executes an increment, it becomes two. But then, uh, yeah, if, if you zoom into it, you realize that it's uh, what, what, what it is actually. It is uh, some kind of read first. And then, Update. So you you write. Okay. So you read the content of the shared memory location in your local memory. Uh, perform some local computation. You just add one to it and then write the result back. And these are two atomic operations now. Yeah. Which means that uh, it's it's somewhat similar to to this. Yeah. You have a read and write. And, and as a result, if you, if you treat both of these counter increment, increments as, as, a, as a pair of atomic shared memory accesses, then uh, again, we, we have a problem. So let's, uh, 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 let's try to model it again, similarly. So that this time, let's uh, assume that uh, um, yeah, let's let's add the so this is this is this thing and then we read the counter. Yeah, so to to get some state. Yeah. Read counter. What kind of counter values we can obtain? Yeah. And here too. So here here's the same and then uh, read counter. Okay. So what kind of values you can get? From the counter, one or two, yeah, because there are most two different uh, increments you can witness. Yeah, if the, the initial value of the counter is zero, uh, again, so you have uh, uh, P zero has uh, two states, uh, and uh, P one has two states. Yeah, so P zero can obtain zero or one. No, why is it one? One or two? Yeah, sorry. One or two? Well, I can also get. I don't know why 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 I wrote it this way. Let's let's uh, let's write it this way. I think it's better. One. Or two. Okay. So which combinations are possible? Remember, we we, we connect two. Vertices. Well, here it's, we call it vertices. Two vertices of different colors, of course, because the color is a process identifier. If these two states or the, the corresponding states can be observed in the same execution of, of the program, and yeah, this is our program: increment the counter, read the counter; increment the counter, read the counter. And each increment is, is actually a pair of these kind of uh, uh, operations. Yeah. Can I have this link here? I can. Why? What, what, is, what is the possible execution? Uh, 
I started with the hardest part. Maybe I, let's, let's, uh, let's consider the, the simplest one. The simplest one is when you don't, you don't have any races, really. You, you don't have any conflicts on data. They, they increment the counter in a nice way. Yeah, for example, they both increment the counter. P0 increments the counter, then P1 increments the counter. They both read the values. What do they read? Two. Yeah, they got two. Yeah, so this is the... Uh, and then you have an, one execution in which P0 increments the counter, reads the counter, obtains one. Yeah, this is our, this is this state. And then after that, P1 comes, increments the counter, reads the counter, reads two. Yeah, so this is this. Is this. Yeah, so I got this kind of uh, link. Yeah, so I messed up a little bit, but uh, the, the, now symmetrically we, have, we also have this. Okay? What about this one? And this is exactly the problem where, where the, which arises because you have uh, uh, you have reads and writes and you don't have atomic uh, increment operations. Yeah? So if you, if you happen to concurrently execute by P0 and P1 the first instruction of this uh, counter pair, yeah? so they first both read zero in the memory. Locally, they evaluate one as the next value of the counter, and then they concurrently write to, back to the counter. And both of them write one, and then read the value of the counter, and both get one. So you're, you have this possible thing here. OK, so, the, so far so good. So this, this, uh, this kind of, so I will, I will, essentially, this is what, what I'm going to talk about. So this, uh, how to visualize different concurrent executions in a, in a combinatorial way and possibly translate the combinatorial representation into a geometrical one and then play with the geometrical, like embedded combinatorial structure in space, in Euclidean space, and reason about the properties of this uh, structure which you embed in space and deduce something about uh, what's computable, what's not. Okay, so this is, a, this is the idea. And just one last illustration, which I think is good because it's, um, it's, um, uh, it shows that the, the structure we obtain is, uh, uh, well, it depends so much on the power of the model. So there are different models, and sometimes it's very hard to compare uh, the power of models, but uh, let's consider a specific model in which you, you have um, um, what they call a test and set instruction. Yeah, so we, but these programs we, which we discussed so far, uh, they have, um, uh, in some sense, they, they have very weak synchronization mechanisms. So they have this reading and writing, and read-write memory is considered to be basic. It, it exists in almost every uh, hardware machine, but it's, uh, it has some limitations. And specifically, it has a, a limitation of being historyless. So the operation which you perform doesn't depend on the state of the memory and the, on the... Uh, uh, and the effect of operation is, is uh, if you update, for example, the memory, you don't depend on uh, what is in the memory car currently. And uh, the alternative uh, uh, synchronization which you can use is, uh, is conditional. So it's something which you're, you try to update the memory, but the, the success of your update operation depends on the state of the memory. So in one atomic operation, you read and write back. For example, like what, what, what an, an ideal counter should do, you, sh you read and then you increment and write back the response. And this well, one possible primitive, which also is present in many in, in the hardware, it's called test and set. Yeah, so it's, you, have, you first test the memory and then you set back the result. And the idea is that your your it really operates on the memory of, of a single bit, yeah, zero or one. So it, if you execute a test and set, test and set operation on the memory, you you check if the memory is zero. And if it's zero, it replaces the, the value with one. If it's not zero, it does nothing. It can be zero or one, it's a bit. If it's zero, it replaces, st st writes it to one, and then ret returns a response zero. Yeah, it says, okay, you, you're lucky. You're, you were the first to access it. Uh, everybody else who's later accessing the memory, which is already set to one, uh, gets uh, one. Okay, so it, it always returns the original value. You know, let's uh, let's suppose that we have uh, again uh, 
P0 and P1, and both of them execute this test and set operation on the same memory location. I don't know, let's call it R. R. Yeah, this is this a test and set operation. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I use this uh, brackets to show that it's, uh, it's an operation. It's a primitive which you get from the, from the memory. The question is the same. What kind of states we can obtain? Yeah. So remember that the test and set returns 0 or 1. Yeah, it returns 0 if, if you are the first to access the location. Yeah? And, and 1 otherwise. Okay, so, and here you have a pretty nice way of, of breaking this uh, type of connectivity. Because you see that all uh, situations we discussed before, you had structures which are very well connected. And you have paths between any two vertices. What we get now is something like this. And have, yeah, so you have uh, uh, P0, which obtains 0 or 1. Yeah? So it's uh, 0 if it's, it's lucky and was the first to access test and set, and 1 otherwise. And then you have uh, P1, which has, again, 0 and 1. OK? And now, thanks to the uh, virtue of this uh, test and set primitive, what we have, we have this, of course, P0 goes first, then P1, or this. P1 goes first, then P0. But we don't have this bridge here. Why? Because the, out of two processes accessing the same test and set, test and set instruction, exactly one wins. Yeah, you cannot have both losing. Yeah? Respectively, you cannot have both winning. OK, so this is, uh, this is the, uh, so the, and this is, this is a disconnected structure, and uh, in some sense, it's more powerful than the connected one. Why? Because we have less executions. You have less executions means that you have less non-determinism in, in your system, and which means that some problems are easier to solve. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a usual phenomenon that the less non-determinism you have, the more predictable your system is, the easier it is to devise algorithms for, for the system. Okay. So I think I, I, I will stop with the introduction unless you have uh, questions already. Okay, so in the rest, what I will try to do is to um, to uh, give you some high-level like motivation of why we actually care, why these distributed algorithms. I say like, distributed, distributed, but why why do, why why should we care? Maybe we. It's such an exotic uh, field of research that maybe we shouldn't uh, worry too much about these kind of issues. Especially given that it's quite difficult yeah, to analyze distributed algorithms. So I will start with very short primer <laughs> distributed algorithms. I will give you like some basics. And this class is about shared memory communication because there's also a huge domain which relates to message passing, like where processes communicate using message passing. Uh, I, I'll, I talk about shared memory only, and basically about read-write shared memory and some restrictions of read-write shared memory. Uh, we'll discuss some problems which are typically considered in this domain, and starting with the classical problem of consensus, and, and then to general, generalized forms, forms of consensus which are called set consensus, and more generally in the, um, to the notion of distributed tasks. Um, and then we'll discuss the formalism in combinatorial topology, which can be used for, for modeling these kind of models uh, and problems. And as I said, uh, you can look up for, for the slides. Uh, and actually, I, I made a couple of exercises yeah, just for, for fun, you know, so you, you can look up. Um, Literature-wise, I think the most related uh, uh, reference here is, is the book uh, which is comparatively recent by Herlehi, uh, uh, Rajdaum, and uh, Kozlov, which is called combinatorial, uh, distributed computing through combinatorial topology. Uh, it is actually uh, available uh, in the digital form, I don't know, in, in, on multiple platforms. I guess you can, you can look it up. And for the um, uh, distributed computing part of this class, uh, I usually refer to the lecture notes, which are constantly under preparation and uh, hopefully eventually will come out. But uh, it has some basics of what, uh, what I'm going to talk about. And there are some classical books, uh, which are like starting from the 
very thick book by Nancy Lynch uh, on the distributed algorithms. Uh, and, uh, and a little bit more recent book on uh, how to relate different models of distributed computing using simulations. So this, uh, this is a good reference too. Okay. So we have sequential processes. Yeah, so if each of the processes can be seen as a Turing machine, but the system as a whole, modeling it as a Turing machine is not very uh, convenient. You could, but it's not, it's not convenient because you lose a lot of interesting details about the, uh, the mechanics of the system. So we, we tend to see them as independent sequential processes that communicate. And communication, well, uh, well I, this, 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 this kind of general definition applies to basically every computing system nowadays yeah, for two reasons. One reason is that um, we have this boom in networking. Yeah? We have uh, basically uh, software now is, is rarely run on one computer, it runs on multiple computers uh, because uh, you try, people try to keep data closer to the clients and uh, try to replicate to make it more reliable. So as a result, you have to synchronize and exchange data. So you're, it's, it's becoming distributed by design. Um, and maybe the other problem is, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the other reason to, to use this kind of uh, model of distributed algorithms is that you're even if you want to run your software on a single pro uh, processor, on a single computer, it's very likely that you won't be able to. Why? Because uh, there is this tendency of, uh, uh, well, there used to be a tendency of increasing the computing power of a single processor for many years, and it was exponentially increasing, what we understand as a, a Moore's law, but it, it, it stopped at some point because, uh, yeah, your physical limitations of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, semiconductor technology where you just simply cannot put semiconductors close enough so that you benefit from, uh, uh, from uh, having too many of them uh, without uh, spending too much energy on cooling. So that's uh, basically the uh, mechanics behind this. And in the distributed systems, what you have uh, is basically two major models of communication. Shared memory, where you have collection of shared objects. You access the object, get some response. And uh, the, the objects, they maintain some state. They have some state transitions. And typically, we also have this, uh, well, why it's becoming difficult, because uh, sometimes you have uh, uh, asynchrony. Yeah. And most of this uh, lecture is going to be about asynchronous system. You have no synchrony assumptions whatsoever. And you have also potentially failures. Well, failures is an abstraction for very slow behavior. Some process, for some reason, is swapped out to disk and uh, it cannot be accessed and uh, it, it, uh, uh, you, you cannot wait for him. So you're, if you want to make progress, you should better uh, do progress without this process. Yeah. And that brings us to a very popular notion of weight-free algorithms where you're, 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 uh, your own progress depends only on your steps, not on steps of other processes. That's, well, the alternative, of course, a more general model is message passing. Yeah, so instead of uh, maintaining state in the memory, you send messages over channels. Uh, so here, in addition to difficulties related to a shared memory context, you have other difficulties. Yeah, you have problems uh, of, uh, of channel denoise. Yeah, your, the channel doesn't transmit your message instantaneously. It takes some time, and sometimes the message delays are unbounded. You have uh, problems of uh, communication graphs. Yeah? Sometimes you cannot communicate directly to another party. You need to relay messages through someone else. And the power of your model depends on the density of your communication graph. Yeah, so you have all this stuff which is even makes your life even harder. So this is not what we are going to discuss today because uh, it's too complicated. We go to shared memory models and specifically to read-write shared memory. I will skip this. This is not uh, important. Um, so all, the, all this, it's, it's basically motivation of why, uh, why it is an important uh, field of research. But uh, I, I, it's not, it's, for this audience, it probably doesn't matter. So challenges here are quite classical for computer science. You try to understand what, is, what does it mean to give a correct implementation. And the correctness for us, I will define a couple of problems with some correctness specifications. But what does it mean to solve a problem? Yeah, before we actually go to uh, proving impossibilities or 
analyzing complexity, we need to understand what exactly we implement. What, is, what, what does the program da, do? So what is the correct implementation? And then, uh, then once we define the uh, correctness, we need to go to the costs, yeah, the complexity. And uh, yeah, so we have uh, all kinds of uh, failures, asynchrony assumptions. And uh, finally, it turns out that some problems are simply impossible to solve. Some desirable programs, they just don't exist for specific models. Yeah, so we, we come to the impossibility results and what we call computability bounds of some models of computation. Uh, well, uh, still I, I will come back to this. Uh, it's important that we, we, we distinguish this field of distributed and concurrent computing. Concurrent, usually it's a, it's a distributed system on a shared memory context, from parallel computing. And so, so many people mix these things. And for us it's important to distinguish because parallel computing is about efficiency. How to parallelize computations on separate ideally chunks of data so that your, your, uh, the time span you spend on the, uh, on the computation is shorter. Here it's about synchronization and correctness. Yeah. So we, have, we deal with programs of this kind where they, by design they, they raise the conflict on data and our question is how to make this conflict uh, invisible to the users, transparent to the user, so that the user doesn't suffer from the fact that the, uh, there are data conflicts on the, uh, on the, on the program level. And Leslie Lamport is one of the f sort of founders of this field. He would say that, okay, distributed system is the one where you're, the, 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 uh, your own performance or your own computation depends on failures of some processes who, who, who we never heard of. So this is, this is, some, this is what, uh, what distributed is about. And typically, they dated back to the uh, problem of mutual exclusion introduced by Dijkstra in the end of the 60s. Yeah, so you would, uh, this, usually, would say this is the first problem of distributed computing, problem of accessing indivisible resources by concurrent problems. Okay? And then, uh, well, there was a long way, which is, uh, for us, I think, the, one of the steps which is important for us is that this link which they established between the uh, distributed computing models and combinatorial topology. I think this is it's roughly dates back to the early 90s up to, uh, up to now. I think it's still, the, the progress is still, uh, it's, it's not finished. It's not, it's, this is a story which is still uh, going on. Um, one of the difficulties here is that uh, uh, basically every research group in this domain has its own idea how to model a distributed system, so you have different perspective on uh, how to model, which parameters are important. You can either talk about programs which use logs, or some programs which use uh, I don't know, compare and swap primitives. Uh, these are transactional memory. There are assumptions about how many processes can fail, which is called resilience. Uh, you have uh, some people like message processing, some people like transactional uh, shared memory, and uh, well, there are desirable models which I will probably mention. So the main question is, okay, given all these parameters which you can use to specify your system, which, which of them matter and uh, matter for what? So that's, uh, that's basically the motto of this uh, work is, uh, is how to unify these different perspectives and get something uh, tractable, okay? Okay, so um, very quickly, I will go through this uh, shared memory ba uh, basics. So what we have is a model. Yeah, we have a collection of processes. I don't know. Uh, usually, we have to start from P0, P0, P1, P2, P3, and we have a collection of objects. Yeah, each object, for the sake of this lecture, is atomic. It has uh, has some specific uh, sequential behavior and exports some set of operations. You can access. It. For one example of an object is a shared memory register. Yeah, the, the, the ones we used in the example. And the register can be written and read with atomic read and write operations. Okay. Well, also I gave the example of, of a test and set, of compare and swap objects, and so on. So there are different things which we can specify using shared objects. Uh, right. So this is uh, we already discussed. So and uh, well, uh, again, for for there to do things tractable, you need to simplify sometimes. And one way to simplify is to assume that uh, we have registers, which can be written and read, 
but we don't assume any bound on the amount of data you can write to the register itself by one write equation. Yeah, it could be, uh, could be arbitrary. It's like an unbounded register. What's important is that you, you cannot read multiple registers at the same time, maybe sometimes, but uh, what, what, uh, uh, well, you cannot write to multiple locations, but if you choose the location, some address to write, you can write any value. It's actually, it's, of course, it's a, it's a simplification, but uh, for the sake of computability bounds, it's, it's good enough because it says if you cannot do things with this simplifying assumption, of course, you cannot do it in a real model where your registers are bound. Okay. Another abstraction which we, uh, we, we will find useful is the abstraction of an atomic snapshot. So actually, what, what's uh, tricky about registers? Well, for, this, for the case of two processes, it doesn't really matter, but as soon as you have three or more, the ability of reading multiple registers at the same time makes your life much more easy. Um, you, you, if, you, if, you, if you, for example, have an abstraction in which you can write to your own memory location, then read in one atomic operation all other memory locations. Uh, you, 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 so, you sort of uh, reduce the number of possible executions quite considerably. Okay, so and this is exactly what Atomic Snapshot provides. So it's, uh, it has two operations, update and snapshot. Yeah, so it, each process PI has its own update I operation. Yeah, update just writes the value somewhere and returns OK. And snapshot returns all values written using updates so far in one atomic operation. Yeah, just returns all the values. OK? So in a sequential execution, is just like this. Here, yeah, yeah. For each, for each uh, vector returned by a snapshot operation, vj is the argument of the last update for this particular position. So you're okay. So this is, and we're going to assume that this is given to us. Yeah. And actually, there is a very nice algorithm which implements atomic snapshot in some specific sense. I didn't say what implements means, but it emulates an atomic snapshot using just reads and writes. So there's no, there's no much uh, uh, exaggeration in assuming that uh, this uh, uh, this abstraction exists and uh, can be used. Okay, and let's uh, let's look at a specific protocol, specific algorithm which uses atomic snapshots. Yeah. Here we have multiple processes already. Well, to make it interesting, we have more than two processes: yeah, I know, P0, P1, P2, P3, and so on. And each of the processes they executes this algorithm. It's similar to what we had with read and write. Yeah, so if you write somewhere and then you read, here you write. Yeah, you update your own position in the vector, on the, in the atomic snapshot object, and then you take the snapshot. Yeah, and this is the view you get. Yeah, so you can see it as a vector, one position per process, or you can see it also as a as a set of values. If you assume that every process has a, in its own unique value to write, and usually this is the case, you're you have your own unique value, which is sort of colored with your identifier. So then uh, when you take a snapshot, you can treat this result of the snapshot as just a set of values. Because you know each value, you know which process it comes from. Okay? So this is, this is my very simple algorithm. I claim, given the, the specification of, uh, of the atomic snapshot, that this vectors, SI, obtained by different processes pi, like S0, S1, S2, they satisfy these two properties. Yeah? One property is immediate, it's called self-inclusion. It says that the value which the process writes itself, of course it contain, is this contained in the snapshot. Yeah? You, cannot, you cannot miss it. You first write it to the memory and then you take a snapshot, of course you find at least your own value there. Yeah? So self-inclusion is immediate. But this one is also kind of easy to see simply because the, the snapshot uh, operation is atomic. is the fact that whatever SI or SJ you take for any process PI, PJ, uh, and you take what, what exactly they obtained from their snapshot operations, the results of these snapshot operations should be related by containment. What does it mean related by containment? It means that either all values which are, which are seen by I 
are also included in, in, in SJ or vice versa. And it basically depends on who was the first to take the snapshot. Because again, we say that snapshots are atomic operations. Either I, uh, if PI was first and then PJ came and took the snapshot, of course, all values returned by PI are also returned by PJ. Maybe some more values are seen by PJ because some new update took place mean between these two events. Or vice versa. PJ was the first and then PI sees exactly at least these values of PJ plus potentially some more. Okay? So this. Okay, so why, I, why I'm talking about all this? Well, mm, because I want to show that atomic snapshots are good, but not good enough I, for, for, for the purposes of for modeling. Yeah? So let's uh, consider this, um, uh, this execution. Yeah? So we have three processes now. I think it is this kind of executions, they can only arise in systems of three or more processes. For two, it doesn't really matter. But for three, it matters. We have three processes. Uh, well, at this time, I, I choose P1, P2, P3, but it doesn't matter. Three processes. These are the points, well, sort of, uh, at which uh, the corresponding operations uh, of the processes took place. Yeah? So for example, uh, P1 executes this update here. P2 executes this update here. P3 executes this update here. But, uh, What's important is that P1 took the snapshot before P3 took its, took it up, its update, okay? And then you have two snapshots, you have the remaining snapshots of P2 and P3. And each of them finished the algorithm. And so here, what I have is the vector returned by the snapshot, uh, snapshot operation. Uh, here, uh, well, uh, well, um, I, I'm not very consistent with what I'm saying, but here, 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 I'm, I'm assuming that the initial value of each of the processes in the snapshot vector is zero, and each of them writes one in the first update. Yeah, update one, update one, update one. Okay, so basically, your what you get as a state after you complete this protocol is the binary string, where one is set as the position of the process whose update you see. So for example, here, P1 returns snapshot 110, which means that it sees update of P1, update of P2, but doesn't see update of P3, because update of P3 took place after the snapshot was taking place. Okay? Here, this both snapshots, they return 111, because they see all the updates. Yeah, the, the snap, these two snapshots were taken after each of the update, each of the updates took place. Okay? So what we see here is that P1, it sees the, uh, the value by, by P2. But the snapshot of P2 is much bigger than uh, the snapshot of P1. It's bigger than the snapshot of P1, yeah? So somehow P2 was very fast to write, but very slow to take the snapshot. And in some sense, it's, it's, it's kind of, you have very loose uh, like the, the two events, update and snapshot, very loosely decoupled. Yeah, they, so you have no control over this interval here. And as a result, you have this kind of phenomenon. So you, I see you, but I don't know what you saw. Yeah, there's no any idea for me to, to realize uh, uh, what, what you could have seen. And this, how does it manifest? Uh, yeah, let me, let me skip this. How does it manifest? This is uh, the first uh, combinatorial thing which we, we're going to see. Um, well, not the first. We already discussed uh, the case with two processes. But now, now it's, it's almost symmetric, but it's for almost the same, but for three. So what does it mean? So here we, we took all possible states reachable by these three processes. Yeah. I, I don't mark it. Well, I mark some of them, but not all of them. Every vertex here has a color, and the color for P1 is red, for P2 is blue, for P3 is white. So all white vertices here are possible states reachable by P3 after it completes this protocol, okay? Edges have the same connotation. Two edges are, uh, two vertices are connected with an edge if you could see it in the same execution. But uh, I didn't, since I didn't put the marks here, we should 
actually guess. I will, we'll, we'll see what it is. But first of all, I just say that, okay, I, I organize it this, this way. I will explain why. And let's start, first of all, you have always a state for each of the processes. You have a state in which the process was very fast and only sees itself. It doesn't see any, anybody else. And it, it writes to the memory, executes update, takes the snapshot before any other process executes an update. So we have self-inclusion. We have containment too, but, but we, uh, the, the set which uh, P1 sees is very small. It's just his own value. Respectively, we have the same situation for P3 or P2. Okay? Now let's consider P1 and P2 and forget for a moment about P3. Let's assume that P3 is very slow and comes later. For P2 and P1. What, what are the possible situations? Either they both see each other, yeah, or one of them sees only itself, and the other one sees the other one. Yeah, so this will really discuss this kind of scenario. And this is exactly what is going on here on this edge of this triangle. Yeah? So this is the vertex, well, red color is process P1, which corresponds to the situation where P1 sees P1 and P2. And of course, it's connected with an edge to this vertex because this is a possible execution is in which P2 executes update, takes a snapshot. P1 executes update, takes a snapshot, and sees, of course, P1 and P2. P2 sees only itself. Symmetrically here, we have a similar situation. Yeah? P1 was fast, then P2 comes and sees only itself. But forget for the second about the, the rest, all this stuff. We only consider... And you, you see that this, uh, this you have three possible executions, which are which we already discussed, yeah, depending on the order in which processes execute update and snapshots. Yeah, and, and for two processes, update and snapshots are the same as reading and writing. It doesn't really matter, because it, yeah, essentially they only read the, the register of the other process. There's no, nothing really to snapshot. You just you are only interested in one memory location. Yeah, and symmetrically, we have the same situation here and here. Yeah. These are the situations in which two processes are faster than the third one. And yeah, they complete the protocol before the third one even started. Okay? Make sense? Well, if we explore this further, so we have this, so we, we, we explored what's on the boundary. Let's look what's here. What are these states? These are the states in which each of the processes sees everybody. Yeah? So they first, for example, they first all execute their update operations, and then they execute their snapshots. Yeah? Once, if the snapshots are executed after the, the updates, the snapshots return all the possible values we could see. So these are, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll just. So the, this is, for example, the, the, uh, the vertex which corresponds to the state of P3 after it executes the snapshot and it sees everybody. Yeah, symmetrically for P1 and P2. Yeah, so you have this. And of course they are connected with, the, with edges because this is a, uh, this is a possible, uh, possible execution. They all execute update and they all execute snapshot after that. Yeah, so this, uh, and uh, now we have edges and we also have what we call simplexes. Simplexes are sets of vertices which are connected with edges. Yeah, so it's like a, it's, a, it's a clique of edges which, which gives you a, a simplex. And a simplex is a set of vertices which can be obtained in the same execution. The definition is always the same. Yeah. For example, if we take this triangle here, yeah, it's a simplex, yeah, a set of vertices, where, which corresponds to an execution in which P2 was fast it sees only itself. Then P1 comes, sees P1 and P2. And then P3 comes, executes this update, it sees everybody. Yeah, so you have this, this execution here. This one, for example, is an execution in which P1 and P2 execute their, their updates. Then they execute their snapshots. They see each other. They don't see P3. And after, only after they took their snapshots, P3 comes, executes this update, and takes the snapshot and you get the triangle here. And symmetrically, you can repeat all this and uh, find, maybe this one we didn't discuss. P2 is fast, sees only itself, 
and then P3 and P1 come together. Yeah, so they come at the same time, execute their updates, see, of course, everybody, including P, uh, P2, but P2 only sees itself. So that's, that's, that's an execution. However, I said that it's not very nice, and I will see why it's not nice, uh, the, the, uh, the atomic snapshot uh, abstraction. Because you may have, well, something like this. So this is exactly the run I described before. So you have P1 and P2, yeah? They come together, perform updates, yeah? P1 sees P1 and P2, but P2 is slow. It, it takes some time before it takes its snapshot. And it takes the snapshot so that it sees updates of everybody. So P2 ends up here, not here, here, because it sees everybody. P3 also sees everybody. So what you have as the result, you have what, a collection of triangles here, a collection of uh, 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 simplices, and then you have another simplex which sort of put on top of the others, right? So it's, 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 it overlaps. And the overlapping here is not nice because you uh, you cannot visualize this specific model of computation using atomic snapshots using a subdivision. You cannot say that starting with some specific structure in the beginning, after you complete your protocol, what you get is a subdivided complex. It's not really a subdivision because you you have some simplices which are which which are just not, they are there, and they overlap with some, someone else. So if you want to embed it, well, the, technically speaking, if you want to embed it in a space, you need more dimensions than just two. Yeah, for three processes, potentially you could embed it in a plane, but not this one. This structure cannot be embedded in a plane. So you need at least three-dimensional uh, three dimensional space to, to find it uh, uh, nicely located on the Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, this just to motivate the uh, uh, another abstraction, yet another abstraction. Once uh, once I'm finished with this, uh, we'll, we'll go to more uh, um, maybe uh, interesting stuff. But I think it's still important because this 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 is exactly the model computation which I'm coming to, which I'm going to use. And uh, this is the model computation which is based on uh, immediate snapshot. It's not atomic snapshot; it's an immediate atomic snapshot. It's an atomic snapshot with, with some restrictions. And basically the restrictions are such that this kind of executions do not instantiate. Okay? So I want to avoid unbalanced runs. I want all the runs to be unbalanced. And the trick here, okay, so you, you now you, I, I hide all this. I don't know what exactly is going on. I, I assume that there is some operation in which you write and read and get a snapshot uh, of the memory. So it has Ex at least the same properties as atomic snapshot. So you have self-inclusion and containment. Yeah, so exactly the same. So if you, if you execute your uh, write read, at least you see your own value. Every uh, pair of outcomes uh, produced by this protocol is related by containment. Uh, one of them is a subset of the other. Yeah, so it's the same as with atomic snapshot. But additionally, I have this property. What does it say, this property? It says that if I see someone in my snapshot, then the values which this process sees are subset of my values. And he couldn't go far beyond. He couldn't see more than I've seen. Okay, this is a very important property. It means that the interval in which your the interval between your update and your snapshot is sort of related to the intervals of other processes. It cannot be arbitrarily large. Okay, so this is this is what I made. So for all i and j, if v i, which is the value of process pi, which it writes here, is an SJ, then SI is, is the value, the outcome of the snapshot, is a sub of, subset of SJ. And now, actually, well, it should be proved, but this is a fact, which has been proven. What you have for, uh, for immediate snapshot, for one short immediate snapshot, just one, you execute this operation once, and evaluate your state, which is now a set of values, you can visualize it like this. Yeah, so you, 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 what, 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 what it is actually in reality, it is a part, a specific type of subdivision, which is called standard chromatic subdivision. Chromatic because it takes takes into account the colors of the process. So every every uh, simplex in this 
simplicial complex which you get, which you obtain after after you apply the subdivision is uh, is colored. Yeah, so every vertex has a distinct color. Yeah, and why it's subdivision? Subdivision, but technically it means that your uh, the union. Well, you have uh, the geometrical representation of the union of uh, of all simplices in the uh, in this complex is uh, homeomorphic to the uh, to the geometrical representation of the original triangle. Okay, so that's uh, and of course the uh, uh, the uh, uh, right. So this be, yeah. So th and this is this is what uh, what is uh, what makes it uh, attractive. Yeah. So you have uh, you started with some structure. Well, the state of the system, which is modeled as a triangle, you apply one round of this model of computation. What you get is is, is the same structure but subdivided, more fine grain. Yeah, so you have uh, depending on the execution, so how many executions you have for each execution, you have a specific triangle. Yeah. For each possible reachable state, you have a specific uh, process state, and altogether, they still maintain specific properties of the original structure. Yeah, if you started with a triangle, if you apply uh, one round of computation of your uh, immediate snapshot model, you get a subdivided triangle. Okay, well, uh, when I say subdivided, I should, I should uh, prove it. Yeah, and uh, luckily, uh, it has been proven. So it was conjectured to be a proof uh, for some time ago, actually. Uh, but uh, the formal proof was not presented until comparatively recently. Yes. Uh, I'd like to make the other with me. Yeah. Uh, so the aim of the theory is to study the basic read-write model, but uh, it does not imply the good combinatorial structure. So you consider the uh, equivalent immediate snapshot model, and then study it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't say about. I didn't say anything about equivalence yet. Yes. But I will come to this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so far, I just say, okay. Imagine that we have a, an abstraction with these properties, with yes. with the properties of immediate snapshot, and what you get is a very nice combinatorial representation of the model. Yeah. But of course, uh, maybe uh, this uh, this shared memory abstraction simply is, does not exist or cannot be implemented. So no, I, I'm of course, and you're right. We, we we come to the equivalence. Yeah. But before we come to the equivalence, let's uh, like, like uh, one takeaway from this slide is that okay, you have you have a model of computation which is called immediate snapshot, and uh, the model implies a subdivision. Well, it, it actually, in the combinatorial sense, it implies a subdivision of the state of the system. Well, in one step, yeah, you can you can actually move on and you can continue, and you can. Uh, Run further and further, but uh, uh, later on we'll consider iterative immediate snapshot. But uh, what's important is that just apply it once, you get a, uh, get a subdivision. And as you say, yeah, it's, uh, it is apparently it is equivalent to to read write, well, to one atomic snapshot. But atomic snapshot can be implemented in read write, so it, it is a, it has the same power. Of course, it has at least the same power of atomic snapshot because it's a restriction of atomic snapshot. It has less executions. But what's important is that it's actually, it, 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 in the iterated way, it can be implemented using uh, uh, using atomic snapshot. Yes, we can. Uh, no, sorry. Um, uh, let me let me rewind. Um, uh, so far, I, I, I didn't say anything about iterated. I'm just saying that okay, there is this uh, uh, immediate snapshot in one. You only access it once. Uh, but uh, We'll see that even if you were, if you use it in an iterated way, it, you don't lose any power. Okay, so I, I just give you very quickly one algorithm. That's probably going to be the only distributed algorithm we consider in this class, because I think it's it's nice and I think it's, it gives you some flavor of what's going on behind the curtains and, and in this uh, business of uh, shared memory computing. So I described the abstraction of atomic snapshot. And I described the abstraction of immediate snapshot, which satisfies the same properties, but plus something else, yeah, plus, plus this property of immediacy. 
And uh, the algorithm I'm going to describe is actually taking multiple atomic snapshot objects and implements an immediate snapshot. Okay? So the, the algorithm is very simple. Actually, it has a, a very nice uh, recursive structure. I didn't write it in the recursive way, but you could do it in the recursive way, actually. So you start with the algorithm for a large system, and then recursively you invoke an algorithm for a smaller and smaller system until some condition holds, and then you are you're ready to, to produce a, res a result. Okay, so this is how to get immediate snapshot from atomic snapshot. Yeah, so you have as shared variables, you have n atomic snapshot objects, you have n processes, and n is the uh, number of processes here. Yeah. Initially, well, this is supposed to be bottoms, initially empty, no, no values there. Yeah. What do you do to execute your immediate snapshot operation? You run through all these layers. Well, potentially you may run through all these layers. And you can visualize it as a, as a sort of floors. Yeah, you have n floors. You start from the top floor and you go down until some condition holds. Yeah, so you have floor n, floor n minus 1, floor 2, floor 1. Potentially, you have n processes coming together. You can write to the memory. So each of them would start with floor uh, n. They would access atomic object, atomic snapshot object a n with their values. They would take the snapshot of this atomic snapshot object. And then they would take the size of the snapshot, the number of values they see, and the number of processes who concurrently or previously have written to this atomic snapshot object. Okay? If it turns out that the number of values which you see is exactly the floor which you are on, you're done. Yeah, you return the, the current set. Yeah, the current set. And this, this is believed to be the outcome of your uh, right read operation, this is of your immediate snapshot. Otherwise, you go down. Yeah, otherwise, you continue. You go the next level and next level and stuff. So specifically, you can imagine that if you, if you, for example, want specific execution in which everybody comes to it at the same time, you have exactly n processes writing to the level n. So concurrently, they all write here. Okay? What's important here? If you have n processes concurrently running, writing to the same place, well, to the same uh, atomic object, there must be some out of the set who was the last to write. Okay? And this specific process, which, which was the last to write, when it takes the snapshot, he's obliged to see everybody because he was the last to write. All other updates which took place, or to all other writes, took place before he accessed the memory for, for reading. Okay? So the, at least one process, well, at least the process who was the last to access the memory would get the whole list of participants, the whole list of processes accessing this floor. We have n processes reaching level n. At least one of them would stay at level n. Why? Because the condition of getting out is what you see exactly n processes. Okay? So you have n, n coming here. You have at most n minus 1 coming down. Yeah, at least one would stay behind. And now I mentioned recursion. Now you, you just uh, apply the same logic further and further again because now you, you have the same algorithm essentially with n minus 1 floors, with n minus 1 process. Yeah. Of course, you go to level n minus 2. Now you have at most n minus 2. And again, the same algorithm. But for two processes, What's happening to, well, now if you apply this inductively, at most two processes come here, right? Well, one of them is uh, staying here. Maybe both of them can, can stay here. Both of them can put uh, a snapshot of size two. Yeah? Or maybe one of them would stay here and the other one goes down and uh, outputs here. Yeah, it only sees itself on level, level one 
of course, it returns a singleton set, which is its own value. So it is not as a linearization order, it's from bottom to top? Uh, well, there's no linearization. The immediate snapshot is not a linearizable object. <laughs> I'm not looking for linearization. I'm looking for, uh, for the immediacy property. Okay. That's the only property which I want to prove. The fact that if you return at level i, and someone else returns at level j, it means that uh, those, well, uh, let's, let's uh, there, is, there is level, uh, uh, let's say, uh, somewhere here, i and j, and j is higher than i, yeah. yeah? Necessarily, if I return at level j, I see the value of i because the process went through this. But not only this, additionally, I know that i can return either on this level or level lower. If it returns a lower level, that means that everybody which I see here, well, everybody which I see is, is included here. And this is exactly what the immediate property is. Yeah. It could be seen that some certification or right on the reader from bottom to top. Is it correct? No, not really. Again, uh, immediate snapshot is, is, is uh, notorious for not being, for not having sequential specification. It doesn't have a sequential specification. If you think about it, it's um, uh, if you imagine two processes running concurrently, yeah. they I both see. write and read, and then uh, you cannot put them in sequence okay. because they see each other. Yeah, it's like a rendezvous point for them. Yeah. But it is uh, set linearizable. It is set linearizable. You can you can extend the notion of linearizability to to this kind of uh, abstractions. Yes. Okay. So this. In some sense, it's a very elegant algorithm which gives you the, uh, the, the, uh, the abstraction which has a very nice combinatorial representation. And from this point on, we're gonna stick to immediate snapshots and, uh, and uh, forget about atomic and read-write because immediate snapshots are nice. Uh, right, so let me, let me briefly, I think at some point we should take a break, uh, not, to, not to overdo. So, I, I don't know. Uh, let me let me finish this. Uh, yeah, this I already discussed. Um, correctness is not. Yeah, let's let's. I, I will just mention immediate iterated immediate snapshots, and then we then we, then we take a break. So, <clears throat> um, the fact that uh, some round of computation gives you some nice mm, topological representation actually allows you to. Uh, to uh, to reuse it, to reiterate it. Yeah. So you here, instead of well, we consider just one shot. Yeah. This is what one shot write read thing. But let, now imagine that we can repeat it over and over again. Yeah, so imagine we have, we have this kind of program. Each process PI runs this kind of program. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a class of programs which we call full information. You, know, you see full information in the sense that whatever you get here, you use as, as an argument to write in the next, next iteration. Yeah, so you don't lose information. You start with your own input. You collected a set of inputs of other processes in the first round. Then you, the next round, you write this set as your input. And you collect the set of sets of process inputs as, a, as, a, as an outcome. Then you write the set of sets, and then you set and get the set of sets of sets. So you have the more and more uh, uh, structured information, more and more kind of sophisticated information in each, in each round, from round round, but you, this way you sort of don't lose any information. You, know, you, you keep track of everything you've seen so far. That's why it's called full information. And the, there is a claim which is quite natural, if you think about it, that uh, if you're if you can solve the problem in some model of computation using some algorithm, you can do it with, with the full information algorithm. Because in full information, you can just lose, you can just filter out anything which you consider to be not, not important and uh, focus on important stuff. Yeah, so you're, and that is, that is why uh, whenever we want to prove something to be impossible to solve, for us it's beneficial to consider full information protocols because uh, it means that if, you, if it's impossible to solve with full information, it's not possible to solve with any other algorithm. Okay. And this is, this is the algorithm we should consider. Right? So we have forever, well, we can say forever or you know, for until some condition holds, 
we do this. Yeah, we increment the round. In each round, we use the current information which already assembled as the input. And what do, what, what, what do we use as a communication abstraction? We use a separate, separate immediate snapshot memory. It's so completely abstract. Yeah, so of course, it has nothing to do with, with uh, physical reality. We don't have this memory. We don't have unbounded memory. We don't have infinitely many immediate snapshot abstractions. Immediate snapshots are not provided in the hardware. It's all mathematical, but it's, it's, it's good because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's nice, clean, and it can be implemented. You can actually deduce uh, this kind of abstractions from uh, real hardware machines. Okay? So we have, and this is what we call iterated memory. Yeah. So we have layers of memory. Sometimes they call it layered memory. I don't know. Or iterated. Immediate snapshot one, immediate snapshot two, immediate snapshot three, etc. But each round of this protocol is accessing a specific memory, immediate snapshot R, getting the, the, out the outcome and submitting this outcome to the next immediate snapshot. And etc. 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 Okay. So you never come back. So you, once you access the memory, you never touch it. Yeah. And this is exactly what uh, what this protocol is doing. And why it's good? Well, because we can uh, iterate subdivisions. We already learned that uh, one one iteration is a subdivision. Yeah. So we started with uh, this is our initial state. Yeah. So the initial state means. Yeah, P1 has its own input value, P2 has its own input value, P3 has its own input value, and this is the only, uh, the only state possible, right? So this is, nothing happened so far. Yeah, so this is my initial state. Yeah. Global state of the system. You run one round, you get this. Yeah, so you have, like, I don't know, I guess uh, there are 13, 13 different executions. Each execution corresponds to one specific triangle here, yeah, depending on the order in which Processes uh, take steps and what what they see. You have this. Well, I, I don't. I don't forget about this. We we don't talk about order of steps step, steps because we already know that all executions of this protocol of immediate snapshots are captured by this uh, representation. Yeah, so these are all possible states which are which can be obtained after you run one round of this uh, iterated immediate snapshot model. Okay. So this is this is one round. Yeah. And this is called uh, we call it chi s two s two is um, um, uh, the what we call a standard simplex, yeah, standard two-dimensional simplex. Yeah, two because we have three processes, two-dimensional because you can embed it in the, in the, in the, in the two-dimensional space. So this is our notation. Standard chromatic subdivision of the standard two-dimensional simplex. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, and well, okay, so it's and then I can move on. So I can sort of. I can, since it's a separate memory, so for each state which you reach here, yeah, you run it for one more round, you get a subdivision of each of these triangles in exactly the same way. Yeah, it's a beauty of it because you don't have, uh, you started from each, whatever state you, you start here, you run one round of this uh, algorithm, you get exactly like this subdivision, but ingrained into this triangle. This is what we get. And you can move on and move on and move on. You have more and more fine-grained subdivision of the same type. Okay. And this is this is what uh, we are we are having. So the uh, I think uh, I will probably stop here. So this is I think I should I should have called it uh, chi two. Yeah. So we uh, notation which we we are usually using is something like this chi r. Of uh, of some uh, complex. Yeah. This is R R times iterated immediate snapshot. Okay. So uh, I, I suggest we have like ten minutes break. Is it okay? Ten minutes. Yeah. So like we resume at uh, three or five. Is it okay? And then then we go to slightly more topological things. Any questions, by the way? Okay, so feel free to uh, ask questions during the break. Well. So shall we continue? Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I, 
the, the first part was about m the model of computation. So we describe, described a specific model of computation, which, which is abstract, but realistic in the sense that it can be implemented. Uh, well, uh, I won't give you the implementation and so on, but uh, believe me that he, it, it is this iterated memory. However abstract and crazy it looks, it still has some uh, physical meaning. Well, I showed that you can go from atomic snapshot to one shot immediate snapshot, and if you, you can implement one shot, of course you can implement iterated, it doesn't matter. Uh, the interesting direction is the other one, if you're to show that if you have iterated memory, uh, how to implement some form of read-write communication, and this is actually what, uh, what this uh, couple of papers do, does. Uh, do uh, what is, it's, uh, it's, uh, you cannot implement it in the full extent, yeah, because, namely because it's iterated, so whenever you iterate, it means that you write something to the memory, and if you are too slow and you write it uh, late, nobody was going to see it ever, yeah, because the, everybody has passed through this iteration already, so there are some limitations, and this basically means that uh, you cannot implement it in the weight-free way, you implement it in the log-free way. Yeah, weight-free means that you're your, every, each of your operations takes place in the finite number of your own steps. Here you cannot guarantee this because, uh, yeah, you are, as I said, you can, you can be lost forever. Nobody could see this. But some operations I've seen, and it's actually it turns out that for, for the class of problems we are interested in, which are called distributed tasks, this equivalence is good enough. The bottom line is that if you can solve some important problem in the iterated immediate snapshot memory, you can solve it in the classical read-write memory and vice versa. So for, for this class of problems which you call distributed tasks, the two, problem, the two models are equivalent. And this is, this is why we, for the rest of the class, we are going to be uh, working in the immediate snapshot memory. Uh, right, so this we, we will skip. Um, okay, so a few words about the problems. Uh, so I talked about models. Now, what kind of problems we want to solve? Um, uh, so the classical problem is the problem of consensus, where you're, you have a collection of processes. Each process starts with its own private input. And at the end of the computation, it's supposed to produce an output. It's called consensus because uh, everybody should uh, produce the very same output, which could be, should be one of the inputs, okay, to make things non-trivial. You cannot, def you cannot all decide on some uh, default value, which, re which doesn't depend on the inputs. At the same time, if you decided something, if you output some value, everybody else who outputs a value should output the same value. Okay? Well, in the simplest form, you have a binary consensus where the input values are zeros and ones. And in more general form, it can be uh, any arbitrary range of values. Yeah. Um, well, there is a more formal definition. Uh, there is a trivial protocol, of course. If you don't have any failures, and you have a read-write communication, you have some set of processes, then uh, solving consensus is trivial. Uh, you're, you pick up one of the processes to be the leader and decide on the value proposed by this process. Yeah, so no, no problem. If, you don't, if the process is not going to fail, eventually you will, uh, uh, yeah, you will, if your process is zero, for example, P0, you just write your, your value in some dedicated register. Otherwise, everybody else waits until this dedicated register is not bottom, and then you return the value which you find there. Everybody decides on the value proposed by process P0. Easy. Difficulty comes when uh, P0 might fail. And in this case, everybody would wait here forever. And so the uh, uh, the, well, I, I skipped through the formal definition, but one of the properties which we require is that uh, no process takes infinitely many steps without deciding. Yeah, so the, every correct process decides. A well, correct process is a process who is able to take infinitely many steps. And here, of course, if uh, P0 fails, then everybody would read infinitely often this uh, register D and would never terminate. Yeah, not good. And in fact, well, it's not only the property of this algorithm that it doesn't terminate. You can show that no algorithm actually solves consensus using read-write, tolerating failures. In the extreme case, we just consider two processes. One of them might fail. 
and Ms. Will convince ourselves that these uh, this, uh, two processes cannot solve consensus. How we do this? Uh, well, we do this using this uh, iterated immediate snapshot memory because we already showed that, okay, uh, this iterated immediate snapshot memory is equivalent to read-write, and if you want to show that something is impossible in read-write, it's enough for us to show that it's impossible in, in the iterated immediate snapshot memory. Okay? And for two processes, it's easy. You have just uh, uh, like layers of, uh, of two process, two, two position arrays, and uh, each process in every layer you write to your position, read the re register of the other. How we model this? Well, model is like, like, like before, yeah? We have initial state is P0, P1. Yeah, let's say P0 has the input 0, P1 has input 1, for example, yeah? The goal for them is to, after some number of iterations of the immediate snapshot memory, uh, get the output, yeah? To produce some decision value, 0, 1. Yeah, there are only two values proposed, yeah? Initially, P, PI only knows its own input, yeah? One iteration, you have these three executions. Three executions, four states. Two iterations, yeah, you have each of the three executions is subdivided in three sub -literals. so you have nine executions, um, more states, I don't know how many states. Yeah. Okay, two rounds. The thing is that, well, maybe let's, let's uh, take a step back. You cannot decide in the first round. Why? Because if you decide in the first round, well, if everybody decides in the first round, here, by the property of consensus, P0 only sees its own input, which is 0. Here, P1 sees only its input, which is 1. So remember that consensus requires that the set of outputs should be the subset of inputs. Yeah? So if you only see input 1, you have to decide 1. If you only see input zero, you should have to decide zero. Because you have, have no clue if one was proposed or not. Okay? So which means that if you decide after the first round, P0 must decide zero, P1 must decide one. But then we also have agreement. Yeah? If you have an execution in which two processes decide, they should decide on the same value. So P0 decides zero here, which means that P1, which is in the same execution, should decide zero. If it decides zero here, P0, which is in the different execution, it's not the same execution anymore. So you consider this one where P0 was fast, and now consider this one in which P0 is not fast. It actually sees the value of P1, but P1 has the same state. Yeah, P1 has the same state. P1 cannot distinguish this execution from this one. P0 should decide zero here. And now we have this execution here in which P1 decides one, as we convinced ourselves, P1 has to decide one, it only sees the value one, and P0 decides zero. This is a contradiction. For instance, in the first round, they cannot decide. But you can repeat this argument over and over again, saying that no longer, no, no matter how long you run this iterated algorithm, your structure remains connected, which means you have two endpoints of these intervals, this point in which P0 must decide zero, and this point in which P1 must decide one, which are connected over a chain of executions. Yeah, so no way to decide. So you, you have to, no matter at which point you end up your execution and uh, decide uh, on the value, you have a string of zeros starting going from this point, string of ones going from this point, at some point they clash and uh, you have a violation of something. Either you violate termination, meaning that you run for infinite number of rounds without termination, or you violate agreement by showing that there is an execution in which two processes decide different values. Okay, so this is just, just a high-level understanding of what, what uh, consensus impossibility is about. And it turns out that yeah, it's, this, is, uh, uh, this can be generalized. Uh, one thing is uh, it's, this result is weaker than it could be. You can actually show that if it's a stronger result. You can show that even if you have, this is for two processes, one of them may fail. Yeah. In some sense, you have n processes. Half of the process can fail, for example. No, actually, even, even if a single process out of million or billion processes can fail, still there's no algorithm. But it, you need a different uh, proof for that, slightly different proof. Um, so this is just for you, so the, which means that uh, in the shared memory context, uh, even one resilient consensus algorithm doesn't exist. 
And one resilient means that the algorithm tolerates a failure of a single process. If you don't know who's going to fail, a priori, uh, there's no way. You can always construct for any algorithm, you can always construct uh, an execution in which some properties of consensus uh, are violated. Okay? Um, very quickly, why, why consensus is interesting. Uh, consensus is actually crucial uh, because it somehow helps different processes synchronize. They synchronize their views of the system execution, of the evolution of the system. Yeah, you, you, we already observed situations in which different processes, they, they sort of, uh, because of races and scheduling, they have completely different views of the state of the system. But using consensus, they can sort of con uh, consolidate the states. So they can agree on something. And specifically, you can use consensus to build a universal construction. It means you're given any sequential program using instances of consensus, as long as different processes can solve consensus. They can run this program, in par well, not in parallel, but in run it in the, in, the in the resilient way so that uh, from the external perspective, it looks like a sequ sequential execution of a program, even though some parts of the processes can fail. So you can, uh, it's like full tolerant uh, sequential execution. But it's very useful for uh, state machine replication, this kind of algorithm. So it's widely used, this kind of approach. So this is just to say that consensus is, is very useful, uh, primitive. So that's why the fact that we cannot do it in a resilient way is uh, frustrating. Yeah? We, we want it, but we cannot do it. So we, we, want to, we need to restrict something. We need to restrict our system model, make it stronger, so that uh, consensus could be solved. Um, yeah, so there, this is what uh, consensus is about. Uh, there is this notion of consensus power, consensus number. Uh, it's a different thing. So you can use it for implementing uh, uh, sequential programs in the concurrent context. You can also use it to measure power of different models of computations. Uh, and uh, there are multiple research questions related to this. Uh, what's also, I think, consider interesting to consider for us is the generalization of consensus. Yeah, consensus is about agreeing on one value. You can also generalize it. You can say, uh, well, I don't care. I don't want to agree on specifically one value. But as long as the number of values I output is smaller than the, the, the number of inputs, I'm good. And this is called set consensus. Or sometimes you say k-set consensus if you want to show, uh, to guarantee that number of outputs is, uh, is of size at most n. So you have, uh, it's not at most k. So you, you, you produce at most k distinct outputs, then it's k consensus. For example, for k equals 1, it's going to be consensus. At most, one distinct value can be produced in every round. Yeah, so in the set consensus, you have processes who start with uh, private inputs. Yeah, they, they have some different drinks to, they want to drink. But then at the end of the computation, they choose at most two. And yeah, they don't want to buy more than two different drinks. They buy, uh, uh, they buy uh, only two. Yeah, so that, that is what uh, set consensus is about. You decrease the number of uh, uncertainty about the system after the computation. Yeah, so outputs should, be, should form a bounded subset of inputs. Yeah. And the bound is the parameter of the problem. So if, if you bound this k, we say it's k set consensus. When we say just set consensus, it means that it's smaller than the, uh, uh, than the number of processes. Yeah, so you have n processes. Each process comes with its own distinct input. At the end of the computation, they produce outputs so that the set of produced outputs is at most n minus 1. Is of size at most n minus 1. Okay, so you get rid of at least one of the inputs. So you, there is some non-triviality here. Yeah? You started with, for, for, for the case of consensus, you have two processes, one with 0, one with 1. At the end of the computation, they choose either 0 or 1. Yeah? So you see that it's, it's, a, it's a pure generalization of consensus. Yeah, uh, one thing which I, I said that the, uh, the um, uh, Consensus abstraction helps you to implement a universal construction of one replicated state machine. K-set consensus helps you to implement K-state machines. Yes, it's, uh, uh, but uh, the, the trick here is that they, they all, uh, it's K-sequential programs, but only one of them is guaranteed to, to make progress. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a disadvantage, naturally, because the uh, K-set consensus is a, is, a, is a weaker problem than set consensus. Yeah, you have more freedom. But it turns out that even though you have more freedom, it's still impossible to do it with, uh, in a weight-free way. Yeah, so you, uh, yeah, so 
weight free again it's in this case it's just uh, you tolerate failures of everybody but yourself yeah, you, you can in the worst case you you may have to produce outputs regardless of the behavior of other processes because everybody can can be faulty yeah, so this is what weight freedom means and it turns out that uh, yeah so the uh, uh, set consensus is impossible. So not only consensus is impossible, even set consensus is impossible, and uh, this is reduced to what we call a Sperner lemma. So it turns out that what is set consensus, well, for, for example, for three processes, producing outputs for set consensus is equivalent to what we call Sperner coloring of a subdivision, of a subdivided complex. So you have you have a complex, or sometimes we can see it as a manifold or subdivided simplex with some distinct boundary. Yeah? On the boundary, you need to preserve Sperner condition, which says that the, the colors which you choose on the boundary should be the colors of the, of the carrier of this, of, this, of this simplex. So for each simplex, you have the carrier, the original uh, face of the original uh, triangle. Yeah? So for example, here, take this simplex here. The carrier of this simplex is, is the original simplex P0, P2. Yeah. Respectively, the colors which you have to choose for, for these vertices should be red or blue. Colors which you choose for these vertices should be blue or white. Here should be, again, red or white. Yeah, because the carrier of this every simplex here, every vertex on this face, is the face with colors, well, here it's uh, red and blue, uh, red and, uh, and white. Okay, so this is, you have a condition on the boundary. On the interior, you don't care. You can choose any color, whatever you like. And if you think about it, it's, it's exactly what the set agreement is, is about because set agreement says, if you decide on the value, it should be decided, it should be value proposed by some process. And if you, if you're, for example, you end up here on this boundary, it means that you only see inputs of P2 and P0. Yeah, you don't see any other process. Yeah, because if you see the other process, you already get into the interior of the subdivided simplex. If you're on this boundary, you only see P2 and P1. Yeah, on this boundary, you only see P0 and P1. Yeah. Respectively, you, are, uh, you have to choose the inputs of this process which you see. Yeah. Well, if you're inside, you can see, you can choose any color. Yeah. And just, uh, just to see that you cannot do it, we have one round, it doesn't really matter. Sperner Rema says that you're, uh, no matter what kind of subdivision you have, as long as you want to preserve the Sperner condition on the boundary, it's not possible. Yeah, so you always find inside, well, no, let me, let me re rewind. So what, what exactly is not possible? It, it, you will always find whatever Sperner coloring you have with, uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with the experimental color means that you maintain the condition on the boundary, necessarily you will have an odd number of uh, simplices uh, which are fully color, colored, which involves, which involves all colors. And this is, this is the case here, for example, whatever, if we, I started with this, for example, I chose this specific coloring on the boundary, it doesn't really matter, whatever I choose, as long as it satisfies the experimental condition, I start coloring the insides of the uh, of the triangle, well, I have to, and then uh, at some point, yeah, I don't know what what color I choose. Whatever color I choose, necessarily one of the triangles here will be full, fully colored. And what does it mean in the in the operational context for us? Fully colored means that you have an execution in which the number of outputs is exactly the number of processes. Yeah, fully colored means that you you decided you decided all possible. Input uh, output values, uh, which which were proposed. So you propose n values, you decide that n values, the properties of set consensus are violated because set consensus says that the number of output values should be smaller than the, the number of input values. So this is uh, yeah. So the okay at a high level. So what we learned so far, so we learned that okay there is a model of computation which is called immediate snapshot. There is a model which is called iterated immediate snapshot going through the situations of the different distinct memories, which is equivalent to read-write, yeah, equivalent in strong sense. So whatever you can solve in read-write, you can solve in the immediate snapshot, iterated immediate snapshot, and vice versa. Uh, well, weight free set consensus is impossible. Yeah, so you can just, uh, by using this nice uh, topological modeling, we can just actually deduce that uh, this is not possible. And now we can actually go 
and uh, put it on a different level and uh, completely abstract. So far, I've been all this stuff which I've discussed was operational. I was I was talking about uh, uh, reading and writing. Now I, I want to forget about reading and writing. I want to talk about in, in the in the space of simulational complexes only, and uh, and give some high level claims about solvability. Okay, so now I, I switch the sets of slides. Just one second. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the the result I'm going to discuss is is known as asynchronous computability theorem. So basically, what it says, it takes a model of computation, takes a problem, an abstract problem which we call a distributed task. So it's like an analog of a function, but in a distributed environment, and it says a task is solvable in this model if and only if. Yeah, it's a characterization. It turns out that you can characterize solvability of a task using the existence of specific uh, continuous maps between some specific uh, spaces. Yeah, so it, and it's an it's a if and only if condition. It says that if such a map from this space to this space exists, then the task is solvable. And if the task is solvable, then this such, a, such a map can be constructed. Yeah. So what, what problems we, uh, we analyze? So we talk about distributed tasks. Yeah, it's like you have a set of inputs. Yes, well, we call it set of input vectors. You have a vector associates an input to each of the processes. You have n processes. You have a vector of dimension n for each input condition. Yeah? All possible input vectors say, constitute a set of inputs. Respectively, we have a set of outputs. These are all possible output values which can be produced. Yeah? And we have uh, a specific, what we call a task specification, delta, which maps each input vector to a set of output vectors. This notation, 2 to the power of O, it is a set of subsets of O. Okay? So for each input, you can potentially have a freedom of producing different outputs. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's quite special for, for this domain that for each input you have multiple outputs. And why, why? And sometimes you have to maintain multiple possible outputs because, uh, because of your semantics, you have semantics of your programs. You have, uh, um, um, for example, consensus. If you have two values proposed, 0 and 1, you must have a freedom of choosing to output 0 and choosing to output 1 because it depends on the schedule in which uh, like process takes steps. If the process who proposed 0 was fast and took steps before the process was, which proposed 1, it has to decide 0. Yeah, it's exactly the end point which we consider so far. And respectively, you must have an execution in which 1 is decided. So for, for the input vector 0, 1, yeah, you have uh, two possible output vectors, 0, 0, 1, 1. So this is, uh, and when we say that the, the task is solvable in some model, well, in our case, in, uh, let's suppose read-write solvable, if there is an algorithm that ensures that every correct process after certain, taking a certain number of steps eventually would uh, uh, produce an output, and the set of outputs, if you form a vector of outputs produced in any given run, is, satisfies this condition given the inputs. You have a vector of inputs i, a vector of outputs o produced in any given execution of our algorithm, then you have this uh, o should be a subset of delta of i. So it should be correct. But now we know that uh, read-write is, uh, is, has a very nice uh, uh, combinatorial representation which actually can be seen as, a, as an iterated uh, uh, standard chromatic subdivision, we have this. Yeah, we can say a task is read-write solvable if and only if there exists a chromatic simplicial map from a subdivision of certain degree, chi is the standard chromatic subdivision we discussed, of some degree r, of the input complex of the task to the output complex of the task carried by delta. Yeah? So the input complex of the task is, is uh, well, is defined naturally from the set of inputs. Yeah? So it's all compatible inputs. Yeah? So you have, <clears throat> it's a chromatic 
simplicial complex. Yeah, it's a set of simplices, colored. Uh, each uh, simplex is corresponds to an input vector. Yeah, so each vertex corresponds to an input, and of course, the given input can correspond to multiple different input vectors. So you have an input gives you a complex. Yeah. Output complex is defined exactly in the same way. The only thing which I didn't define is carried by delta. Carried by delta intuitively means that it, uh, it respects the specification of the task. It's not random. Yeah? So this map, it's, uh, it, it maps some vertices of, uh, of input complex of I, of, of the task I, to the output complex of the task O. But it shouldn't be random. It shouldn't be. Uh, and I, I guess I also should say what chromatic and separational, just to recall. Yeah, so we have, we have a task characterized by this uh, triple, yeah, the input complex, output complex, and the uh, task specification. Yeah, remember, the task specification is a, is a map from I to subsets of O. Yeah. Simplicial map, yeah, it maps. It's a actually vertex map, map vertices to vertices, with an additional requirement. It requires that if I have a simplex, so under this map, simplex becomes a simplex too. So you have, uh, it maps simplices to simplices if you want. Okay, so, it, and it's, it makes sense in this context because you are, yeah, it, it means that, okay, you are, uh, you, 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 you performed your computation, you ended up in some state which is captured by this subdivision. Yeah, you have some simplex in this, in this subdivision which is a possible reachable state. And then you want to decide, yeah, you reach some decision reach some state in which you are ready to produce an output. You produce an output, so you, and of course you want to produce an output which, is, uh, uh, which corresponds to the, uh, to the possible set of outputs, which is exactly captured by this O complex. Yeah. And naturally, you map vertices of, uh, of the subdivided uh, uh, complex of I to the vertices of O in such a way that if you have a simplex, you have a simplex. Yeah. You have exactly possible uh, allowed permitted uh, output vector. What does it mean carry it? Well, cr chromatic, I think, chromatic, uh, chromatic here in this context means that you preserve the process identifiers. Uh, very natural. Yeah, if, you, if you started with, uh, with the uh, pro process P0, you need to produce an output process P0, of course. Finally, uh, carry it by. Yeah, so it's, uh, we have, uh, uh, well, the chromatic subdivision map. Yeah, we call it phi. Yeah, from chi of R of I maps to O. Okay, so this is what we uh, we established. Yeah, and now we want to say that carry it. Carry it means that for all sigma in uh, whatever in the domain of this function, in this map, uh, phi of sigma is a subset of, uh, of uh, oh, I have my subset, belongs to, belongs to, uh, to delta of the carrier of, uh, of sigma uh, in, uh, in R. So what's carrier? Carrier is something which is defined on the subdivision, right? So if you have a subdivided simplex, you can take any simplex in the subdivision. It's a, it's a comp uh, complex. You take any simplex. You can find the smallest simplex of the original complex, which is subdivided, which contains the simplex. And so for, for example, if I take uh, 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 this kind of uh, standard chromatic subdivision, uh, forget about colors for the moment, because for, for carriers it doesn't matter. And I choose, for example, this simplex. This would be sigma in the subdivision. Then the carrier of it would be this face. And because this is the smallest face of the original complex, subdivided complex, which contains, in, this, in the geometrical representation, contains sigma. And if I take this to be sigma, of course, the smallest uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't even have to take it two-dimensional. Let's take, take this, this 
thing, then, then the, the carrier of, of this would be the, the whole symplex. Okay? And of course, implicitly, what does it mean? It means that here, if you decide something after you finish your protocol, you apply this chromatic simplicial map, which we call a decision map. So you run your protocol, you finish your protocol, you, 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 you reach a decision. If you decide something, what you decide should be consistent with your carrier. And the carrier is exactly the set of inputs you see. Yeah, so the, the operational interpretation of this formula is I started with some inputs. I kept running. For example, if I run on this phase, I kept running and running and running. At some, phase I, uh, at some point, I, 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 I choose to decide. But I, I can only decide based on the inputs which I see for coming from this phase. I haven't seen this input at all because it's, it's, it's it didn't take a single step according to me. Okay, so that's uh, so. It, it, there are many things you can talk about, uh, interpret in this in this uh, theorem, but these three three lines basically give us a completely abstract representation of something which is inherently very hairy and operational. And some very difficult uh, distributed algorithm which is hidden there is described in a very elegant and short way, showing that okay, you you just check the existence of a simplicial map between spaces. And that's it. OK? And actually, I, I further, I'm going to make it yet another step. I would say that if, if, if the tasks which I consider are, um, uh, are well, some special class of tasks, which we call colorless, and actually this set consensus and consensus are colorless tasks, you can do it even easier. You can even give a more, even more elegant uh, uh, condition. OK? So this, but this is a crucial, this is maybe the main claim of all this uh, class, is that well, starting from, a, uh, from, um, uh, from an operational model, which is described in terms of interleaving of steps of reading and writing, we gradually came to the formulation of solvability condition, which is completely abstract and which is based purely on the input of the task and the output of the task. Well, input of the problem you want to solve and the output of the problem you want to solve. That's it. Yeah, because the condition says there is a chromatic simplicial map between a subdivision of i uh, to, uh, to O carried by delta. And that's it. Okay, so we don't care at all what's going on behind these scenes. We just care about the, uh, the, uh, the specification of the problem. That's it. And forget about the, all the operational context goes, goes away. So this is the, the beauty of this formulation. Okay. Yeah, this uh, just to say that uh, it actually implies uh, we use here implicitly this immediate snapshot. That's why immediate snapshot instantiates here, read write instantiates here. But to relate the two, we need this fact that they actually equivalent. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, well, just just an example. Yeah. So let's let's I'll go back to. To specific uh, task of consensus, we have three processes, binary consensus. Yeah, the set of inputs is zero or one. Yeah, so if I if I want to visualize the input complex of consensus, I get something like this. Yeah, by the way, I should mention that this these slides I, I borrowed from uh, from the class by Maurice Herlich, which is based on this book on, uh, which I mentioned before. Okay, uh, yeah, so you you have eight uh, no six. Uh, 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 possible states, yeah, two states per process, three processes, six vertices, and uh, one, two, three, uh, and six uh, uh, simplices, yeah, six combinations of uh, which are possible. Yeah. So this is my input complex. All possible initial states. Um, this is my output complex. Now remember that the consensus requires the three processes to agree. So you, I can only have a triangle in which everybody decides zero and triangle in which everybody decides one. Remember that the colors are process identifiers. Okay. And uh, well, already something suspicious here because you started with something which is inherently connected. Yeah, you have uh, a phase in which everybody decides zero, uh, everybody proposes zero and the phase in which everybody proposes one, which is hidden somewhere here, these two things are connected via edges. Yeah? Here you have a disconnected structure. 
And finally, we need to specify the carrier map. This is what, well, I, I didn't say what carrier map is, but it uh, doesn't really matter. It's pretty natural. So you have a map, this delta, the specification of the task, how we define it. All inputs, all zero. Yeah, so this is the simplex in which everybody's proposing zero should go to the output in which everybody decides zero. Yeah. All inputs one should map to all inputs one. So this is for each simplex in the input complex. I need to specify where it, where it, where it can, can go, what is the sub complex of the output complex to which it can be mapped. And finally, if, if I have uh, mixed zero and one, I can any other simplex which we're, which we have in the input complex of, of this task can go anywhere. Yeah, so this is a sub complex, which basically is a, the whole output complex which you can use. Okay. So this is my my definition of consensus. And more generally, task specification is you have input complex, you have output complex, and this carrier map. This is my abstract task. Whatever uh, carrier, well, maybe I should say carrier. Carrier is pretty natural as a property, and I think, uh, yeah. Let, let, so it, it, it just says that if you're, if you're, well, intuitively it means that if you, if you, if you started with a set of inputs, and you produce some. Uh, uh, you have some possibility of producing some outputs. If you start with the strictly larger set of inputs, well, uh, more processes participate. What you get is strictly larger uh, option. And you cannot get a smaller one. So it basically says that if you, more processes participate, you cannot violate uh, the correctness of uh, those guys who, who already produced outputs. And so, which means that it's, it's a task. It's not something else. It's not something which you're, you need to synchronize and wait until someone jump, jumps in and uh, decide based on its values. So, a carrier means a carrier task from uh, uh, what a delta from uh, let's say i uh, to two o is uh, basically it says uh, uh, that uh, uh, for for all uh, for all uh, uh, sigma. Tau uh, in I a sigma subset of tau implies that uh, yeah, delta of sigma is a subset of delta of, of, of tau. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's mathematical interpretation of what I said. If I if if I already decided on something and someone else comes with new inputs, uh, what I decided is compatible with what what uh, what they they can do. So that's okay. So this is yeah. This is how we see tasks. And uh, one thing which I will say is just uh, just to, because I think it's it's uh, it's uh, it's important. Uh, some tasks they don't really care about the identifiers of processes. Actually, many tasks don't uh, don't depend. They depend they depend on inputs, but not who proposed those inputs. In consensus, this is the case. I don't care who proposed zero. As long as I see zero proposed, I can choose it as, as my own, for example, input. I can abandon my input and I can take the input of someone else because, uh, again, the condition of the task says the subset of outputs is a subset, uh, the set of outputs is a subset of uh, the set of inputs. And that's it. Without, without relation to the process identifiers. So basically what uh, I can see the task is a, is a set of input sets, not vectors any longer, just set of values, set of outputs sets, and the task specification, which is again, some carrier map. So you can, you can again reformulate everything in terms of uh, uh, simplicial complexes, but this time, these simplicial complexes are going to be non-chromatic. I, I forget about colors. Basically, it means that if you have uh, um, an input vector in which two processes propose the same value, their vertices co coincide. I don't care who, who proposed this value. I just, uh, I, I, what I care about is in my input simplex, I have vertex of this color. And now the color is actually the input. It's not, it's not the idea of the process. Case set agreement or, or consensus is of this kind. Yeah, so you really don't. Uh, um, yeah, so now, you, now I can uh, reformulate everything in terms of uh, colorless. Um, I, I guess I, I will 
I will not spend too much time on this because I wanted to say a few words about the, the, uh, the more recent stuff. This is, uh, if, you, if you like this kind of um, formalism and this kind of uh, thing, you can find it all uh, in the book or uh, in, the, in the lectures which, are, which, are, uh, which Maurice Herrlich is giving uh, uh, in many, in many, uh, in, on many occasions. So this is, this is kind of standard and this, this is known since, uh, I don't know, 20 years now, I guess. But still, I think it's a, it's a, it's a oh, I, I, will, I will go through it nevertheless, but I think it's, uh, it's probably less interesting than the rest. Uh, so, but what, what, what's, what's good about colors? What's good about colors is that um, uh, you can uh, forget about simplicial maps. You, uh, you can go to continuous maps. People like continuous maps because it's really, you work in metric spaces and you have uh, really like a, uh, uh, so you, 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 even this little structure which we maintained from our protocol, which was expressed in the form of uh, chromatic subdivision, yeah, so this R degree of R of chromatic subdivision of the input complex, yeah, you said there exists some R, some number of rounds which you need to run until your, even this is going away. Because you go to this kind of condition. So you say that the colorless task, I O delta, has a weight free well, layered uh, here, I should have uh, written, iterated, I just borrowed the slide from, uh, from the book, but uh, I used the term iterated, iterated snapshot protocol or read-write, whatever, read-write protocol. So the, the colorless task is read-write solvable if and only if there is a continuous map from the geometrical realization of the input complex to the geometrical realization of the output complex well, again, carried by delta, you can extend this notion of carried uh, easily to, to, uh, to continuous maps. It's, uh, this is not the point. What is the point is that, you remember what I had before, a chromatic simplicial map from chi of R to, to, uh, to O. And what I have now is something much, much simpler. Yeah. Something which, which, uh, which, which doesn't account for, for protocols or for distributed computing at all have is just, just uh, I embed the input complex in the space, embed the output complex in the space. If there is a continuous map between them satisfying the properties of the task, yeah, of course, uh, I'm done. For example, if I have something like this here, this is my uh, input complex, this is my output complex. If, for example, my task specification says that this boundary should go to this loop here, I can immediately conclude that no, 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 no way. There's no continuous map which maps this to this because, namely, because it's a hole. Yeah, there's no, there's no way to. This is not uh, contractible this is, as a loop. So yeah, I can already use some topological properties of the spaces between which I, uh, I want to find maps to deduce computability. I can show that this task is not possible to solve. Or if I have something like this, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have. Uh, if I have, I should do like this. Yeah, I can. I can possibly do it. But okay, sorry. Let me. Let me rewind. So I. Um, this is about weight free. But the beauty of this approach is that for colorless tasks, you can even generalize the 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 theorem. You can say uh, you don't want to uh, tolerate uh, any number of failures. You want to tolerate maybe one failure or two failures. Yes, which with tolerating two failures means that you're, uh, it's not completely you're, uh, you're free to uh, decide uh, in any execution. You, you have to decide an execution in which you see sufficiently many processes around. Yeah, and it turns out that uh, for T-resilient colorless computability, it's almost the same except that instead of taking the, uh, uh, the uh, geometrical realization of the input complex, I take the geometricalization of the, of the skeleton of the input complex of a specific dimension. So the skeleton is, I, I take all simplices of specific dimension. And all simplices of dimension uh, T, or less, uh, or, uh, or, or, or less. Yeah, so this is, so it turns out that it has, it, well, no, sorry, this weight freeze must be T resilient. Well, read write protocol, a colorless task has a T resilient. If and only if there is a continuous map, from the skeleton of dimension T to O, after the geometric realization of the skeleton to O. 
And now it turns out that if, if I'm looking for this kind of solvability, then I can actually say, okay, well, the, for example, I want to solve it one resilient and I have this condition of my task. This I can map because this, this has a hole inside. This has a hole inside. I can, there is a continuous map. Okay, so you can say, already you can say, not only show, show that, okay, for some models and some problems, the, uh, the solution doesn't exist, but for some problems, and some models, for example, one resilient or two resilient more generally, the solution might exist yeah, because the map exists. Yeah. So it doesn't exist in the original case, in this case, but it does, does exist here. Okay? Um, yeah, I think I will uh, skip. I, I wanted to, yeah, this, uh, the proof, I think it's not... Uh, uh, it's pretty technical, this, this kind of proof. And the, the only difficulty here is one direction. In one direction is once you have a protocol to build a continuous map is easy because it's usually it's, you extend a map. Yeah, it's, it's considered to be uh, sim simplicial complexes. They, are, they have like uh, uh, sort of the continuous, less information than the, the continuous space. So you can basically sort of extend this. The difficulty is vice versa. If you have a continuous map, how to get a protocol, how to get a simplicial map, uh, it's, uh, this is a, a kind of uh, tricky, and this is, this is what, uh, what they call simplicial approximation theorem. So you can actually approximate uh, a continuous map with uh, certain types of subdivisions. And uh, here they use, uh, usually they use barycentric subdivision, but you can also use this standard chromatic one. Uh, yeah, I guess I will. Um, I, I will try to quickly say a few words about more recent stuff uh, because I think it's uh, well, yeah. partly advertisement, but par partly also I think it's, uh, it makes sense for for understanding where it goes. So we know how to characterize uh, simple models like uh, weight three. Yeah, weight three, we know. T resilient, we kind of know. Well, I gave you the description for uh, for colorless tasks, but uh, you, there are some interesting results which are not colored, uh, which are not colorless, which are which for which process identifiers uh, matter. Uh, but in fact, uh, well, I already said that uh, there are some interesting problems like set consensus or consensus or some restrictions of consensus, which are not colorless. For example, I want to solve consensus, but not among all the system. I want to solve consensus among subsets of the system. I want to solve consensus among P2 and P3. I want to solve consensus, set consensus, or two set consensus among uh, uh, P4, P5, and P6. So, uh, this, this, uh, all this can be formulated as a task. Test and set can be formulated as a task. For example, I want to implement test and set in my system using some other restrictions of the model. So there are different ways you can uh, play with the uh, task specifications and the different applications in which it might be useful. Uh, and in general, you can see a model as a restriction of the weight free model. Yeah, the weight free model is the most, uh, the weakest one. It contains all possible executions. If you take a subset of these executions, this you can call a model. And these are, uh, and then depending on what restrictions you take, the more power you get. Yeah, the more restricted your model is, uh, the more power you get. Yeah, you can take maybe, you can decide that your model contains only what they call lock free execution, or lock free, uh, um, uh, lock step executions where uh, everybody's running synchronously. Yeah, everybody's writing at the same time, everybody's reading at the same time. So this is lock step, it's completely synchronous. So you can, you can take this as a, as a restriction. And then magically everything becomes possible. And then you say, okay, well, this may be too much. Uh, maybe I cannot, I cannot afford it. My scheduler uh, in my real system doesn't allow me to do this. I should put some execution back. But it depends what executions I put. I put the, some executions and then turns uh, suddenly my uh, system becomes as weak as it was before in the weight free case. Who knows? So this, this, all these questions are still poorly understood. We don't really understand the power of the model, how to measure it. And there are, there are some uh, ways 
to do this along the lines of, uh, of the asynchronous computability theorem. And some results are obtained, and some of them are pretty promising. OK, so we consider restrictions, submodels of the read-write model. And here, as a language to describe these restrictions, we choose the language of adversaries. So this was suggested some time ago in a different context. And the idea here is that you, um, you sort of try to describe non-uniform failures, correlated failures, if you want. So sometimes correlated means that you, you, one process fails, the probability that another process fails is getting higher. So the, the, the failures are not really independent, which is, can be the case. I don't know, you have a, a multiprocessor machines, you have cores on different processors, and if there is a hardware crash on the given processors, all the cores on this processor fail. All processes which are run on this processor go away. So it, it's a, it is a correlated failure. So taking uh, assumptions like T resilience, where you say, uh, well, with the given probability, given process fails, and all these probabilities are identical and they're uniformly distributed, is not realistic any longer because really there are some strong coupling, uh, strong, there's some strong coupling between failures of different processes. So this, roughly, you can say that, okay, uh, let's imagine that you have a system of n processes and uh, uh, as you define a set system on this system, yeah, a set of sets of these n processes, and you expect that in every run of your system, only elements of this set could be the correct process. Yeah. So, for example, I can say I have three processes, P1, P2, P3, and either P1 is the only process running, or P2 and P3 should run together. This, this is my, my model. Yeah, so this is, which means that either you have basically two, two partitions, P2, P3, if they fail, they fail together. If P1 fails, P2, P3 should be running. So the, the probability of failures of these two partitions, uh, of both partitions is very low. I neg neglect it, but uh, I can't have this uh, separation. Okay, so this is, this is non-uniform failure model, and this, uh, this is uh, quite powerful for us. Okay, and uh, yeah, so it turns out that some, there are some multiple results already on this. I will consider just one specific. Um, so here I'm talking about partially about my work and the uh, work with my student. So this is um, a work which we, we call affine tasks. So we say that we, we take a restriction of the model along these lines of adversaries, and we define this model as, uh, as again, as an iteration. So you say the restriction is, is ugly and uh, hard to understand, but it turns out that in many cases, we can represent the model of this kind as an iterated task, exactly in the same way as the read-write model could have been represented as a task of immediate snapshot. Well, I, I didn't call it a task, but you can see it as a task. Okay. So the, the high-level motivation is that we have uh, a model, which is uh, long-lived. Uh, long-lived means that it's, uh, yeah, there's no bound on the number of tabs and uh, no bound on the on the schedule, well, in this kind of uh, adversarial, there's no bound on the number of steps a process can take before uh, some other process takes steps. So there's no, there's no uh, relative process bounds. Uh, but it's also non-compact. Well, non-compact in the sense that, um, should I go to this? Um, you can, uh, well, you can treat uh, uh, a space of executions of the model as a metric space, basically. So you can, uh, why? Because you can say that to the, the closer are the two executions, the longer is their common prefix. I should, I should put it different. The longer is the common prefix of two executions, the, the closer they are. So basically you can introduce, introduce the metric as the uh, one over the longest, uh, the length of the common prefix. For two, for, two, uh, for two executions. Yeah? And this, this would be the distance between the two. So it gives you a metric. Okay? So respectively, you can uh, uh, introduce the notion of, uh, of a closed and open set in this, in this space. And, uh, and uh, what does it mean to that a subset of uh, sets of execution is non-compact? It means that you have uh, a sequence of executions 
which converge to, sigma, to a given infinite execution. Each execution in the sequence is in the set, but the, the limit is not in the set. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not closed. Yeah. Uh, and this is the case for, for many models. Yeah. For example, the model of, uh, of one resilience, yeah, the model in which uh, everybody but one process can fail, yeah, at most one process can fail, is non-compact because you can take uh, any sequence of um, uh, infinite, uh, you know, finite executions in which, uh, let's say, uh, uh, only one process takes steps, yeah, which means that everybody fails but one. Uh, well, not fails, but it, everybody's slow by, but one. Each of these executions is in the model, but the limit in which the infinite execution in which one process takes steps is not in the model. So you had, it doesn't belong to the set, so it's not comp Anyway, so, so the, the ugly uh, operational models can be represented as, one, in, as, as nice uh, tasks. And basically, these tasks are described through the output complex, which is uh, a subset of the second degree standard chromatic subdivision. Yeah, so the, the result is uh, the class of adversaries has, uh, has this task. For a class of adversaries, this claim is true. And for we, one specific adversary which we uh, consider is an adversary which called K concurrency. It's an adversary which says uh, uh, um, these, the life sets are of size K. Yeah, so all processes, so all, I only consider executions in which uh, at most K processes take infinitely many steps. All other executions are ignored. So this is my model. So I guarantee somehow the schedule guarantees me that eventually at most k processes run concurrently, not more. So this is what k concurrency. And it turns out that for this, for example, for three processes, I take the three processes and standard chromatic subdivision in the second degree. Yeah, remember that we take one, one subdivision of this kind, and then I subdivide it the same way every of uh, triangles here. Yeah, for three processes, one concurrency, no, three processes, two concurrency, all the blue. Uh, triangles here, they constitute my task. Yeah, so this is... Uh, right. Um, but uh, to motivate this, uh, uh, this is, let's consider just a media snapshot. So this is my uh, motivating example. Because uh, this, is, this is what we already know, sort of. We know that a media snapshot characterizes weight-free read-write. Yeah, we can see it as a task. One shot immediate snapshot is essentially a task. You start with inputs, produce an output. Yeah, so you start with an input, which is uh, one of these corners here. Yeah, P2 starts here, P0 starts here, P1 starts here. And the end of the computation, they get a vertex on this output complex, which is a subdivided simplex. And all the vertices which different processes get constitute a simplex. Yeah, this is what, uh, and this is actually, this is a known task, which is called simplex, uh, the, the chromatic simplex agreement. And it's chromatic because you only choose the simplex of your, uh, the vertex of your color. And simplex agreement because, uh, yeah, the vertices you choose should constitute the simplex. Yeah, and of course, this is the case. If you, if you, if you have a, an immediate snapshot protocol, this is exactly the task you solve. And then it turns out, okay, you, you have this solve, uh, you have this solution. You can iterate the solution. You can run it over and over again. You can apply the same uh, task of uh, chromatic simplex agreement on the subdivision of the uh, simplex you get, and so on, and so on, and so on. So what you get is that the uh, immediate snapshot as a task is the, what we call, affine task for, uh, for read-write memory. Yeah. Well, I, I just repeat the uh, synchronous commutability theorem. Just said that read-write says that if you run this task, which is uh, captured by this uh, chi of r, yeah, so you, yeah, so you get uh, something, you get, uh, naturally you get uh, a model which is captured by a one-shot abstraction, which is a task of immediate snapshot. I didn't say anything new so far, it's just the interpretation of what I said before. But I can extend this. Yeah, I can extend it. Uh, yeah, let me uh, drop this. So what is important here is that the iteration of some given task, in our case, immediate snapshot, T star, it's just uh, iterations, it's just a model. The iteration of this task have the same power in terms of solving tasks as the additional model M. Yeah. Solving M, solving task in, in M is equivalent to solving T. Yeah, if you can solve T, you can solve any task which is solvable in M. 
Right, so finally, the definition of an affine task. For us, an affine task is just, uh, just a subset of, uh, of, uh, of some k degree standard chromatic subdivision of the standard n dimensional uh, simplex. Yeah, so we have. Uh, I, 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 sorry for, I'm, lit, I'm not very accurate. When I say n here, uh, here n dimensional means that we have n plus one processes. Yeah, we have three processes. The dimension of the system is two. Yeah, because usually it's the dimension of a simplex is the number of elements minus one. Uh, the, the, the rationale here is that where, in what space you can embed this simplex. Yeah, this, for example, three process you can embed on a plane in a two-dimensional space. That's why when I say Sn, I assume that there are n plus one processes. If n plus one processes simplex, you have a subset of a k degree uh, standard chromatic subdivision of this simplex. Uh, k is usually two, actually, for, 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 for us. So far, we only found find tasks in dimension two, which is great because you, it looks like two is a pretty powerful uh, degree. You, go, you don't have to go further. Such that if you have sigma and you apply this, uh, uh, this task specification, what you get is, uh, is this is uh, over, overlap. And this, this, that's exactly this uh, simplex agreement on this task. So whenever, whatever sigma you start, you subdivide it. What you get as a possible output is an intersection of sigma subdivided with this L, and that's it. So basically, uh, for, for, for the immediate snapshot, the whole uh, subdivided triangle is blue, all simplices. Are. For, for K set agreement, for K concurrency, well, in this case, two, uh, two concurrency, three processes, only these blue uh, simplices adjacent to the boundary are allowed. And that's me. That's, uh, that's our result. So we show actually the, the for K concurrency. I, I will skip all this. I think it's, uh, it's just motivating why K concurrency is an important uh, model. Uh, that's how we define it formally, like all these uh, uh, simplices which are adjacent to the uh, uh, boundary of specific uh, dimension. Uh, illustration. Um, I, I think it's, uh, this is interesting, but it's not, uh, it's not the point. I think this. Uh, uh, I think what, what is important is that uh, uh, is the result. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, you can given sorry given given the definition of this affine task, which we call R K. Sorry for the mess. Given this R K, yeah, this is a task, a fine task, a subset of the second degree standard chromatic subdivision of the initial simplex, I can, first of all, I can show that if I have a k-concurrent model, I can solve this task. Yeah, this is one thing which is a must, yeah, because I, if I cannot solve this task, of course I cannot solve anything which this task can solve. Yeah, not, I might not solve uh, which, which this task can solve. So I, I have, to, have to be able to solve this task. And vice versa, I have to be able to simulate, well, in this case, k-concurrent system using iterations of this task. And this is what uh, most of the work actually is done in this direction, simulation. Yeah, so I, I, I'll skip the technical results because I think it's, uh, it's uh, probably too low level for, for now. Um, yeah, this, uh, yeah, I guess, well, this example. So you have a two-dimensional system, three processes, yeah. You have, uh, uh, and then the simulation. Yeah, let me let me let me skip this. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so far, what what what, do, what did we learn? So we learned that um, uh, let's say for uh, key concurrency, the affine task well, for three processes is something like this. What is interesting is that we actually would. Uh, some affine tasks actually, they don't, might not be a single affine task corresponding to the model. You have multiple. For example, I can uh, show that uh, it doesn't really matter uh, the size of this hole inside. So I include all simplices adjacent to the border. But even if I take out just a single simplex in the middle, I'm going to have the same power. Okay. Intuitively, the more simplices you allow in your, in your definition of the affine task, the weaker is the model, yeah? because you have more executions. But it turns out that it doesn't really matter. 
So as long as I take out one simplex, I'm done. I belong to the class, which is equivalent to the class of, K con of two concurrent in this case. Yeah. So and then, uh, well, naturally you have all, all kinds of other models. Yeah. So we have uh, this is this K concurrency is easy because it's symmetric. Yeah. You it doesn't really matter. You can uh, roll it. You permutate the process, and you have this. Still, you are still with the, still within the model. You can have all kinds of asymmetric models. And you have, uh, and the, the other extreme actually was uh, co concurrently shown by um, uh, Saraf and uh, Herlihy uh, is for, so this K concurrency for, let's say, one resilience, again, three processes. The affine task is something like this. Again, it doesn't matter which simplices I take as long as they don't touch the, count, the, the corners. Again, it's very, very nice. It's, uh, I can, I can, uh, and as long as the, there is, there is uh, uh, the link of the boundary is, uh, is full, so this, uh, that's important. So the, there are some restrictions, yeah. But there are many, there are many, many equivalent uh, uh, affine tasks in the same class. Uh, yeah, there is a, some open questions which we don't uh, know the answers yet. So it's, uh, this is along the lines of, uh, of uh, tasks which are colored and uh, it's uh, non-uniform so that the, and then there is a, there is this kind of uh, well this this is this is we have this well it's a special case of the test it turns out that for for test and set we don't even need the second chromatic subdivision we need to, we can work in, in the first one so these are these are six triangles which you need to maintain to get a problem which is equivalent to the model with test and set read write plus test and set Whatever you can solve in read write with this set, you can solve by iterating this specific affine task. Um, why, is, why is it good? <laughs> yeah, so I, I say uh, I give this uh, compact representation of non-compact models, but I, I think it's just, just, I think it's, it's aesthetically it's attractive because you start with something which is not very, uh, it's operational and hides a lot of, uh, uh, well, depends on many uh, uh, lower level details of the algorithm, experimentations and scheduling, and what you get is, is uh, something more very uh, one shot uh, and uh, easy to visualize. Um, the other thing is that, well, I, I shouldn't probably say, but <clears throat> um, one thing which I didn't mention is the problem of um, uh, decidability. I think I have a slide on this, yes. Um, um, in principle, regardless what uh, criterion you apply, showing that uh, um, a given task is solvable in a given model is an undecidable question. So there's no algorithm which allows you to decide that uh, given a model and given a task, whether the task is solvable in the model. Well, I gave you some cri criteria, but of course these criteria, they do not allow uh, an algorithm to, to be verified. Yeah, for example, the existence of a simplicial map, we don't know, there's no algorithm. Unless the dimension is, is too low. For example, for two processes in dimension one, the question is decidable. But as long as the dimension is three, uh, two or more, it turns out that there is, uh, there is a result which shows that uh, the three process read-write weighted solvability can actually be reduced to, uh, to the task which we call a loop agreement. It's like uh, you're making sure that the loop is contractible, but it's known that the contractible loop uh, is, well, there is this word problem, well, another reduction shown that, uh, okay, two words in the same group uh, system uh, are equivalent. Yeah, so they, they, are, they, are, they say the same thing. So it's, uh, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's, that's undecided. That's a classical uh, thing. But similarly here you can, uh, so for, for some models, the question of decidability is, uh, is important because you're, yeah, you, 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 sometimes you, you want to characterize the set of tasks which are solvable for a given model. And uh, the intuition here is that if we restrict ourselves uh, to affine tasks, the question of relation between models, not, it's a different thing, so again, relation between models. It's not uh, whether one model implements the other or not. It becomes decidable. Again, we still don't know exactly how to characterize the test set of tasks in solving the model, but the power, relative power of the model can be, decide, can be decided. Why? Because uh, as soon as we go to the space of affine tasks, working in the space of affine tasks, we work in the compact and the finite space. 
how many relations you can find between different spaces? Finitely many. So it's a it's kind of things which are which, which, which are just coming, which are given for free. So that's a, that's a, that's one of the advantages here. Okay, so I guess I should uh, wrap up. Um, so distributed computing is a, is a very, well, it's a difficult topic. So it's, uh, uh, and, the, and it's, it's, it's in our benefits to reduce this complexity as much as possible. So we, uh, and generally there are two classes of people who work in the domain. Uh, systems people, they build algorithms. And theory people would try to prove properties of these algorithms. And they, uh, there's a lot of clash, uh, a lot of conflicts between these two groups because the systems people, they want to complicate things. They want to make them more, more, more functional and more uh, attractive for, for whatever reasons. And the theory people are trying to simplify. Uh, so, um, uh, and specifically, we, if we work on, in, in the, on the theories, we work on the theory side, we want to understand uh, the boundaries of computability of, of, uh, of, of systems, whether we can solve a given problem. And solving a problem, sometimes, well, the answering this question can be very hard. So it's, it's a, the, the simpler our models look, the better it is. And uh, so ideally, we want to abstract away all the technical details and work in the completely uh, well-defined and abstract uh, space. So one of the mottos of this uh, work is that we get computability of tasks and be actually related to, to existence of some continuous maps in some spaces, and that's it. Spaces describe the inputs and outputs of the problems we want to solve, and the maps describe the, uh, the specification. Uh, what, what is the correctness between the correctness relations between inputs and outputs? Okay. Uh, well, of course, uh, this formalism is bounded to well, what I talked to so far was bounded to tasks, only tasks. But uh, well. It is common to work with uh, long-leaved abstractions. The problem, online problems, where you input, produce outputs, receive an output, uh, produce another uh, input, and so on. So you're, you're, you work for a long time with the same, with the same data. So this is, uh, again, we don't have any, uh, any nice understanding of how to apply this theory to, to long-leaved tests. We talked about uh, slow processes, yeah? But slow, but they are not malicious. Yeah, so they, they, they can, can get behind, or they can maybe crash, never come back, but they don't malicious. What if they are malicious? If you have security attack in the system and you, some components of your system actually tweak the protocol, they try to do something which your, your protocol is not a priori allowed. Um, we have no idea. So the Byzantine, it's again very, very hard to see how you can use this kind of formalism for, for, for it's called Byzantine behavior. It's like some processes who are not respecting the protocol. Uh, well, there is some work on uh, protocols without identifiers. And the process with protocols without identifiers are tricky because sometimes you're, you're, you have processes which maintain the same state and they cannot distinguish each other. Because they maintain the same state, they don't have any ideas about their identifiers because they are not assigned any. And uh, in some models of computations, there are what they call the process, they call it cloning. You have one process which behaves exactly as another one. And understanding the computability bounds of these kind of models is, 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 uh, is kind of tricky. Uh, well, there are other things like partial synchrony. One thing which I didn't mention, for example, is, is well, uh, okay, well, we evaluated some kind of computability uh, criteria for full information protocols in uh, unbounded memory. So you, you, you can write whatever you like. You write the whole state in your memory in the same location. But this is completely unrealistic if you think about it. Yeah, you, uh, the, the amount of state you maintain grows exponentially with the execution and then uh, suddenly you hit the bound. What happens if you have bounded memory? So this is, uh, if you assume you have uh, a memory which can only maintain uh, I don't know, a certain number of bits. So the, the immediate question is, well, what, is, the, uh, what, is what are the computability bounds for this, for this kind of questions? Uh, yeah, so I, th I think uh, 
I will uh, probably stop here. So I think uh, unless uh, uh, there are questions on the uh, on whatever we discussed so far. Any questions? Yes. This is some, some confirmation. Uh, IIS model can capture completely the uh, how bad each node is currently now. Yeah. Uh, uh, could you say it again? Uh, my question is uh, IIS model yeah. is write the whole history of the execution. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the, in that, is it correct to some node can identify what is the current vertices in the product complex? Product complex? Well, it that can, information is completely available for each node, right? The, the, what, what it can identify is the vertices of uh, all adjacent simplices. Ah, yeah. It knows which ah, yeah, vertices, yeah. Uh, which simplices his current state is yeah. compatible with. Uh, this is. This is, this is his local knowledge. He cannot go beyond that. It cannot know which exactly simplex. You know that the current execution is one of those simplices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's, well, we, we used already this argument when we say. So, in, in, so my question is uh, actually now, uh, I guess uh, the growth of the number of vertices in, uh, number of vertices in complex is yeah. exponential. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, probably in uh, history, Side of history can go much slower. Slower, yeah. So the, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the approach encoding around the, at least the size of the IAS could be reduced polynomial size. Is it correct? Uh, but it still grows very fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how exactly. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know the bounds. Uh, but it grows. You see, the the number of simplices you are compatible with. Especially if you are somewhere in the middle, in the mesh of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if, you, if you see a lot of processes around, it can it also grows. Yeah, it's like your, in, in some sense, uh, what I mean is is the degree of the node in the in the simplest constantly grows. Yeah, the longer you run, the more the more simplices you have. Like you're, because the, the more low level uh, interleavings you may observe. Yeah, so, so I, I, I would probably even claim that it grows exponentially, but I, this I need to check. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even, though, even though you only have your local information, it's not like you, you maintain the whole. Uh, no, it's only your local information. But it's a good question. I never, never ask myself. Uh, Actually, what now the yeah. first thing I thought is that this is all, this is the computer, it's a computability matter, but complexity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, com yeah. I should have said this complexity. Yeah, what, what, uh, what is the cost? Yeah, well, this, this we have no clue. Yeah. 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 The amount of local space. Yes. For example, something if we assume that some kind of local space should be something. Yeah. 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 This, this, uh, this is all unexplored. Actually, I, I guess it's, uh, it's going to be more. Complicated, <laughs> but yeah, the, the question is uh, how complicated it's going to be. So maybe, maybe it's still tractable. Yeah, so we, we, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Proof of asynchronous computability is a theorem. Right. Um, <coughs> so, cha can you extract a pro program from a chromatic sim uh, simplicial map? So, how, how is that proof? Right. So, so we, we, there are two directions, right? It's characterization. So, one direction is you, you start with a program uh -huh. and you build uh, a simplicial map. map. Yeah. So, that's. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's easy, yeah, because the program itself is, is something which you run for a certain number of steps. Well, maybe I should. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I gave two formulations of asynchronous compatibility theorem. One for the general case, which is uh, uh, based on simplicial maps, and one for the colorless tasks, which is based on continuous maps. For the general case. Once we know that uh, immediate snapshot captures read-write uh, models, it's it's trivial. It's just just it's it's not even it's almost not a theorem. It's just it's just reformulation what we all know already. 
It means to solve something, it means we run a certain number of immediate snapshot uh, steps. And then at some point we reach a state in which we know we can decide and we map our decision to the output, uh, to the vertex in an output complex. Of course, this map must be simplicial because we want everybody who runs in the same execution to get to the same simplex in the output complex. Yeah, this is our, our. And it should be carried by delta because we need to respect the task specifications. This part is basically relies, it basically relies upon the equivalence between read, write, and immediate snapshot. Yeah, that's all. The interesting, maybe, which I skipped, but the interesting part was, was about the colorless solubility which uh, says that uh, uh, a task is, uh, so we, we have uh, a task, if we talk, we have a task I, O, and uh, delta, uh, is solvable, uh, weight free, read, write, if and only if uh, there exists uh, a continuous map this time, from I to O, between the geometric realization of I to the geometric realization of O, carried by delta. So this part is, is kind of non-trivial because now it's, it's not, we have no protocol hidden here. It, it, it's, not, it's not, so what we have is just some continuous map. But in one direction, so this is if and only if, so solvable if and only if. So in one direction going, if it's solvable, meaning that there is a, a uh, a certain number of uh, uh, steps of the iterated immediate snapshot protocol and simplicial map going to continuous is kind of easy because there is a notion of uh, of extension. You you have I don't know you you have uh, uh, a simplex uh, uh, and then you you sort of uh, I don't know introduce this barycentric coordinates and uh, in, in the geometric realization and extend this this simplicial map to continuous. So this you can do. The other direction is tricky. I'm not sure I can give you a short explanation, but it's, it's the other direction going from continuous to simplicial is a little bit more complicated, but it is based on the, on the fact which is known as simplicial approximation theorem. It's a, it's a theorem like a, which is proved, which shown that basically you can, under some conditions, you can approximate uh, a simplicial ma uh, continuous map using a simplicial map. And that's exactly this approximation is used to, for protocol. Mm. Uh, what do you mean by that word? Uh, program. So do, do you exclude uh, infinite programs? Uh, a program for me is just, uh, a, again, it's just an automaton. Just so. Yeah, which, which, has, which maintains infinite state, actually. <laughs> It's not a fine state automaton, but it's, 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 it's basically, it's locally, what it does, well, we, I described uh, the protocol, it's just, what it does, it, uh, it starts with the input, writes this input to the memory, takes a snapshot, writes the outcome of the snapshot back to the memory, <coughs> takes a snapshot, and so on, and continuously does this until its local state is such that, that it can map this state to the output of the task. So that's, that's the problem. I think you asked uh, if you are interested in about the uh, transformation from simple map to ah, yes, yes. Yes, uh, to program. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to argue. But yes, I think it is easy to, at least in chromatic case, to, to extract a program. But generally speaking, this is not efficient from the uh, from the viewpoint of complexity, uh, uh, I mean uh, time complexity and uh, state complexity both. So there is a space to study how to optimize, uh, how to extract optimize uh, algorithm from the simplicial map. The complexity of programs we didn't even touch, so we only talked about computability. Yeah, that's true. Non-terminating protocols or 
Hmm. Is it possible to characterize something within topological frameworks? But uh, when you say non-terminating, you you have in mind something like long-lived or what? What's what's non-terminating uh, here means? I don't say long-lived tasks. Something for example, something like uh, okay, let's say the stabilizing processors. Oh. Okay. Even if each right, 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 variable, right, right. So which process the variable you know, just Right. right. So temporarily, you can uh, can have arbitrary states, but you say that eventually you all processes converge to some state which satisfies the predicate. I have no clue. I, it's uh, you see inherently it looks like at least what what we discussed today was mostly tied to the yeah. fact that you're you never reach an incorrect state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever state you reach is is either undecided or decided and correct. Anyway, so now the uh, disk complex captures uh, all possible execution. In some sense, I guess uh, mm. I'm not sure uh, what task is uh, so hard in non terminating case, but uh, anyway, so uh, I need to be yeah. done. Yeah. There, are, there are some interesting uh, things which I don't know, maybe it's. Uh, but it, there, there is like people did some work on characterizing the scope of predicates, which you can do uh, in a standardized way. Yes, I guess, uh, okay, now we have uh, some, uh, some process in at uh, some part of this complex. Then this cannot decide at all because mm -hmm. it has uh, some possibility of a uh, neighborhood simplex, a neighborhood simplex has uh, some pos inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Well, then they, they have to take much more subdivision. Yeah. subdivision. This is some of the characterization why the task cannot decide at that time. But mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's say the non, let's say the stabilizing task. Then, I'm not sure, but uh, this process yeah. does not know the, which way, uh, does not know the, how to say, the, okay, it doesn't require, it adversary can choose the next stage, which simplex, which neighborhood simplex, is uh, some of the stage of the next next round. I guess so the adversary can control the one of the next steps goes uh, as a as a next step mm -hmm. system goes which simplex. This yeah. is uh, some of the yeah. observation in some sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Task. So the uh, if some task can't be solved in stabilizing sense, so any uh, so at least any situation at least one, one simplex, one simplex, if the system goes there, goes there mm -hmm. it still has a possibility of the inconsistent states uh, configuration. Mm -hmm. This kind of characterization looks okay. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't Mm -hmm. be, be I'm not sure it's interesting, but uh, I guess it's... Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the, you see, so far, it's so far, well, it's this, this uh, yeah, the, even the language people speak who work on self-stabilization is so much different from the, from this, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's a, yes, there is, there is a, there is a gap. Everything is quite informal now, right? Yeah, that's a, very, Great, I think it was, it's been a long, uh, a long lasting uh, attempt to, uh, to relate somehow the, the two fields. I'm, uh, I'm, also interested, I'm also interested in something that maybe you know, I try to sound relationship between the mobile robots. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The mobile robots, the configuration is uh, some of the top of the VR values. Yeah. So in this case, also yeah. The, yeah, 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 yeah. interesting. Yeah. But there is a, there is a recent, or comparatively recent, uh, maybe papers or maybe two papers by now about the approximate uh, approximate agreement. It's not about uh, <laughs> consensus, but the the fact that you you, you work in this on the space on the real values and you want to get as close to each other. You can, you can put uh, approximate consensus for this framework. Mm, yeah. yeah. That, that, uh, well, it's limited again, but there, there are some attempts to, to use the formalism of, uh, of simplicial uh, complexes to approximate uh, agreement. Uh, Professor Weizmann and his colleagues were just 
device to stop those girls theory to the mobile robot frameworks, mm. but they they still this week. I see. Mm. There is some. Sure, I wonder what is uh, emitted. What what is IIS? What is IIS model in mobile robot systems? This could be interesting because uh, maybe the uh, why. With a big reason that topological approaching works well is uh, some kind of the representative systems based on uh, iterated mini smart assumption mm -hmm. model because uh, it's of course it cut down some of the possible it's uh, it, that model cuts the possible execution it could happen in a read write model but uh, it never happens in immediate structure model I think that this makes uh, some argument easy to put the all possible execution into some uh, superficial complex. I'm not sure, but uh, so you mean try to construct a high-level communication medium in the mobile robot system? No, no. Uh, what I want to say is that mobile robot also has many possible execution in year value space itself. But uh, I want to restrict it to make the argument so easy. And generally, I want to put that, mm. kind, that kind of the whole possible execution in some kind of logical structure. So mm. The, mm kind of the, the abstraction mechanism. So what, what is abstraction mechanism? This is what I wonder. The question is uh, very far from the content of the Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we can discuss later. Mass, mass <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>